Chapter Ten of Some American Storytellers by Frederick Tabor Cooper. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Ten, O oh Henry. It is a sufficiently common figure of speech to characterize the careers of certain men as meteoric, but usually with no conception of the length of time that it may have taken the meteor to gain the requisite velocity and momentum to produce its brief, fiery burst, and no thought of the stray fragments that remain after the burst is over to awaken the curious appreciation of the enlightened view. If we accept this broader view, then O. Henry was quite literally a literary meteor. Although he had served an apprenticeship of a score of years, he remained up to within half a decade of his death, practically unknown to the general reading public, and by them in half a decade more he will already have begun to be forgotten. Yet for just a few intervening years he achieved a popularity unparalleled in its swift development and its extent by any modern American writer of short stories. And not least surprising was the variety of taste to which he appealed, the range in education, culture and social grade of his reading public considered as an article of merchandise his stories have commanded a market rate rivalled only by mr kipling considered as literature they have formed the theme of more than one grave and reverend professor of english letters the meteor has blazed and burst and burned itself out and the interesting question not unnaturally arises to what extent was o henry's vogue justified is the popular verdict greatly in error? Does his fame of the passing hour rest upon a solid foundation? One takes up the answer with a certain amount of diffidence. As was said in another critical article in one of the magazines quite recently, but while the author of Cabbages and Kings was still with us, such matters rest upon the knees of the gods. It is always easier to dogmatize as to what posterity ought to do than to predict what that profoundly unknown quantity really will do. Nevertheless, certain opinions may be ventured with some assurance provided we base them first upon a few established facts regarding the personal O. Henry, his life, his temperament, his attitude towards his craft, and secondly, upon the really salient points of his own productions. In the first place, then, at the risk of tediously repeating what has recently become a commonplace of the daily press, let us summarize the main facts in the life of this particular American storyteller that his real name was sidney porter and that he happened to be born in greensboro north carolina in the year eighteen sixty seven is not material but it helps to complete the record the fact that his health as a boy was rather poor and that consequently he was sent to a texan ranch at a time when otherwise he would have gone to college has a more direct bearing upon our problem he was not of the stuff from which ranchmen and cowboys are made and although with characteristic facility he picked up his surprising amount of the picturesque idiom of the ranch, a scant three years had satiated him with the life. All this time somewhere in the back of his mind had lurked persistently the ambition to write. Perhaps one of the most curious facts in the world of letters is the unlikely sources from which the public favorites among writers spring. When one sees the apparent hopelessness of conditions that have given birth to some of the successful fiction makers of today, even the most self-confident critic hesitates to say to an apparently hopeless novice, Give it up. There is no chance for you. The life of the ranch had re-established Mr. Porter's health. Following the insistent call of letters, he went to Houston and secured a position on a daily paper, The Post. It is curious how biographers insist upon mixing up essentials and non-essentials. Much has been made of the fact that the Houston Post paid Mr. Porter fifteen dollars a week, and that the editor assured him that within five years he would be earning a hundred a week on a New York newspaper. So far as this means anything, it means that Mr. Porter must have been more successful as a reporter than the editor was as a prophet. Many more than five years passed before he reached New York. The essential facts so far are that he had an inborn desire to write a frail constitution which debarred him from a college education, and the good luck to strike almost simultaneously a healthful climate and a newspaper opening. The following items have their importance. After a year on the post, he went to Austin and purchased for the sum of $250 a newspaper named The Iconoclast from its owner, a certain Bran. The latter, having withdrawn to Waco, and perhaps regretting his bargain, asked Mr. Porter to give him back the paper's name. 
our author with characteristic generosity consented and rechristened his own paper the rolling stone whatever symbolism there may be in names this particular paper promptly rolled itself out of existence and the future o henry went into voluntary exile in central america the fact that he went there with a friend who intended to go into the fruit business but didn't is evidence of a credulity characteristic of him not only then but later as subsequent anecdotes show what he did and what he saw in central america one gleans between the lines of cabbages and kings but the one authentic bit of autobiography of that period is the single laconic sentence most of the time i knocked around with the refugees and consuls mr porter's subsequent movements are given still more briefly in the few meagre printed accounts he returned to texas thence removed to new orleans where he began more consistently to work as a writer and in nineteen hundred two came to new york having received from ainsley's magazine the offer of one hundred dollars apiece for a dozen stories from that time until his death mr porter made new york his home exhibiting that extreme almost exaggerated affection for the metropolis that is peculiar to the manhattanite by adoption now the years about which we know the least are probably the important ones the years of growth and slow accretion the record as it stands fails to explain it shows a man of naturally roving spirit whose schoolbook has been experience hard and practical and who toiled for twenty years before beginning to reap his reward it is easy enough to write sagely that his wanderings have influenced his work that texas gives the setting of short stories called the heart of the west that central america is the scene of cabbages and kings and that new york gives the background for the four million the voice of the city and the trimmed lamp this all sounds as though it meant something but in reality it does not there are probably many thousands of people whose lot in life has taken them successively to texas to central america and to new york yet there is only one o henry what would really be worth knowing is what he was thinking about through all those formative years what books he read and which especially impressed him what sort of work in kind and quality he did on the various newspapers with which he connected himself and above all where he learned his technique of the short story and what models if any he consciously imitated of all this we have only a few meagre and tantalizing glimpses like the following paragraph published in a comparatively recent interview Quote, i did more reading between my thirteenth and nineteenth years than i have done in all the years that have passed since then and my taste at that time was much better than it is to-day for i used to read nothing but the classics burton's anatomy of melancholy and lane's translation of the arabian nights were my favourites the anatomy of melancholy and the arabian nights are indisputably classics but there is nothing in either that could have given a hint of that nice economy of means that unerring instinct for ending a story at just the right instant and with just the right phrase that makes so many of o henry's stories models of technical skill because of his constructive gift he has not infrequently been hailed as the yankee maupassant and yet those who knew him best give assurance that o henry either never made the acquaintance of the author of la parure or else read him only after the great bulk of his own writings was completed and it is equally doubtful whether he became acquainted with french technique through what is probably the next best medium the short stories of h c bunner apparently the o henry story is to a large extent an independent development born of an instinct for getting the sharpest possible narrative effects now it is idle to deny many of o henry's very genuine merits he was technically a master of his craft even though to the practised eye certain tricks of his trade stick out somewhat conspicuously he had mingled on terms of frank comradeship with all sorts and conditions of men the tramp the clerk the ward politician the city policeman the shop and factory girl the human derelict at home and abroad and he has a faculty compared by more than one critic to that of dickens for catching both the humour and the pathos of these alien lives Mr. Francis Hackett, writing recently in the Chicago Evening Post, made the following comment. To O. Henry, the clerk is neither abnormal or subnormal. He is simply fifteen dollars a week humanity. He has specialized in this humanity with loving care, with a Kiplingesque attention to detail. 
but his is far from the humorless method of Gissing and Merrick, who were no more happy in a boarding-house than Thoreau would have been happy in the Waldorf Astoria. One is tempted to ask, parenthetically, why, in the name of all that makes good art, an author should be required to be happy in a boarding-house, or a corner grocery, or an east-side tenement, in order to write of them truly and with understanding. The important fact is not whether O. Henry was happy in the company of clerks, but whether he understood them, and of this his stories leave not the shadow of a doubt. It is true, however, that O. Henry's likes and dislikes do occasionally intrude themselves between the story and the reader, and to the lover of a finished art this is not a merit, but quite distinctly a fly in the ointment of our enjoyment. Another quality for which O. Henry has been overpraised by nearly every writer who has attempted a critical analysis of his work is the excellence of his local descriptions, the accuracy with which he makes you feel that a certain story not only happened in New York, but that it was part and parcel of the city itself and of no other place in the world. It is extremely enlightening as regards O. Henry's attitude towards fiction in general and towards his own work in particular to read the following frank confession. People say I know New York well, but change 23rd Street in one of my New York stories to Main Street, rub out the Flatteron building and put in the town hall, then the story will fit just as truly elsewhere. At least I hope this is the case with what I write. So long as your story is true to life, the mere change of local color will set it in the east, west, south, or north. The characters in the Arabian Nights parade up and down Broadway at midday or Main Street in Dallas, Texas. When I recently ran across this paragraph for the first time, it gave me a rather keen delight, because personally I could never see the excellence of O. Henry's local color. I never could feel that a few names of streets and buildings, printed with capital letters, sufficed to give the illusion of that indefinable atmosphere which a person born and bred in a certain city absorbs from a thousand subtle little sights and sounds and smells, such as that city and none other has to offer. It is a comfort to discover not merely that the fault was not a lack of perception on my part, but a deliberate choice upon the part of O. Henry. In short, that he not only neglected an essential article in Maupassant's declaration of faith as an artist, but that he openly avowed his disbelief in it. It would be interesting to know what he would have thought of Flaubert's insistence upon the supreme necessity, if you are describing only a tree, a horse or a dog, of catching its special physiognomy so unerringly that it could not be confused with any other tree, horse or dog in the whole world. Yet it is easy to understand O. Henry's vogue. He appealed to a wide range of men and women because he wrote of a wide range with sympathy and understanding. He appealed to the wide class that is repelled by anything like academic nicety of speech, by the raciness of his phrase and vocabulary, his habit of making the English language a servant rather than a master. Much of his humor lies in his verbal audacities, and for that very reason he is doomed within a decade to seem in a measure already out of date. And his habit of invoking local and temporal allusions, not merely as subordinate details, but at times as the turning point of a story, is another factor that will hasten the wane of his popularity. Take, for example, one of the best stories that he ever wrote, The Rose of Dixie. It is a story of an old southern colonel who has undertaken to edit a magazine exclusively in the interests of the fair daughters and brave sons of Dixieland. Handicapped by the colonel's strong sectional prejudices, the magazine is not a financial success. So, the stockholders suggest that the aid of a certain Thacker, famed for his successes in forcing up the circulation of lagging periodicals, shall be invoked. The colonel rejects Thacker's much too radical suggestions, but at the same time hints mysteriously at an important article that he has on hand, an article brimful of wise philosophy of life but unfortunately written by one regarding whose qualifications he has not yet sufficiently informed himself. The tale, in order to be appreciated, has to be read. No amount of skill in epitomizing can begin to convey the humor of the denouement, when the article at last appears with the title emblazoned with local significance, in prominent full-face type, and the name of the author so minute as to be almost illegible below it, and that, too, the name of one who, at the time the Rose of Dixie was written, happened to be the chief executive of the nation. A generation hence, the edge of the joke will be quite gone. Indeed, it is already somewhat dulled. 
One disadvantage under which a writer of short stories labors is that it is out of the question to analyze at any length even a tithe of his writings. Thus, in the case of O. Henry, one would be glad to dwell at some length upon each separate volume, to analyze the clever mechanism of cabbages and kings, whereby the reader is carried through a lengthy string of apparently slightly correlated tales, and does not suspect, until the final page is turned, that underlying them all is a mystery, a series of cross-purposes, straightened out only when two bits of human flotsam finally meet and exchange confidences on a North River pier in New York. But to stop long over any one volume or even over any considerable number of stories would serve no special purpose. The more you read them, the more you realize that there is a certain sameness about his themes and his structure, that he has just a few formulas that he invokes over and over again. There is, for instance, the formula of cross-purposes, like the story, if memory is not at fault in details, of the man who pawned his watch to buy his wife for Christmas a fur neckpiece to match her muff unaware that she in turn had sacrificed her muff in order to buy him a watch fob. Or again, there is the irony of fate formula, as exemplified in the story of Soapy and the Anthem, in which a tramp, having made up his mind that a few months on the island will be the pleasantest arrangement that he can make for winter, proceeds to attempt to get himself arrested by swindling a restaurant keeper out of a meal, by breaking a window, by insulting a woman, and all to no purpose. Fate, under one guise or another, intervenes to defeat his plans. And then, at last, as he is passing a church door and hears the swelling notes of a fine old anthem, some softening memory of childhood steals over him, and he finds himself, unkept and ragged as he is, drawn irresistibly into the church with a growing resolution to turn over a new leaf. A policeman, deciding that he is lurking there for no good purpose, runs him in, and Soapy, now that he no longer wishes it, finds himself on his way to the island. And then again, there is what we may call the inertia of human nature formula, the type of story based upon a subtle appreciation of the fact that people often think that they have learned a lesson, but as soon as the stress is over, drop back again into their old rut. One of the best of this class is a story in the volume called The Trimmed Lamp. It is not necessarily the best of the collection, but somehow it made a rather special appeal to the present writer and seems worth giving in some detail. It is merely the story of a commonplace man married to a commonplace little wife and living in a commonplace little apartment on a salary the smallness of which always seems to have the element of commonplaceness. A story, you will perceive, in which the temperamental barometer on the whole stands rather low. After the glamour of the honeymoon wore off, the man fell gradually into the habit of spending his evenings away from the home atmosphere. As surely as the hands of the clock came around to half-past eight, he would reach for his hat. Now where are you going, I should like to know? The wife's querulous voice would question, and his stereotyped answer would be flung back through the closing door. Just going down to play pool with the boys for half an hour. But one night when he comes home there is no wife to meet him, no dinner waiting, nothing but a pervading disorder and a hasty note telling him that she has been called away by the sudden news of her mother's serious illness. Disconsolately he makes a comfortless meal from cold remnants found in the icebox the loneliness of the apartment each instant forcing itself into his consciousness. It is the first night since their marriage that she has been away from him, the first time that he has asked himself what life would be without her. He begins to regret the hours of her society he has voluntarily lost, the evenings he has gone out and left her to bear the same solitude from which he is now suffering. Never again, he tells himself, never again. He will make it up to the little woman when she comes back. He will take her out more, to theatres and all that sort of thing. She shall never again be left to the ghastly loneliness of these silent rooms. And in the midst of his good resolutions, the door opens and the wife walks in. Mother's illness was a false alarm. She did not need to stay after all. This topic occupies them until she finishes dinner. Then, as the hands of the clock move around to half-past eight, the man reaches mechanically for his hat. Now where are you going, I should like to know? comes the stereotyped question, with all its wanted querulousness. And the stereotyped answer comes back through the closing door. Just going down to play pool with the boys for half an hour. Yet in the case of O. Henry, more perhaps than in that of any other popular story writer of his generation, the relative merits and deficiencies of his stories are a matter of individual opinion. 
discuss Kipling in any group of average well-read men and women, and you will find a certain amount of disagreement. Some will hold that the earlier tales are easily superior to the later, and others will insist on the opposite view. Some will maintain that they is his most finished masterpiece, the one story that stands alone upon a lofty height, and others will see little or nothing in it. But on the whole, the world agrees pretty well in singling out, without benefit of clergy, the drums of the fore and aft, the man who would be king, on the city wall, the courtship of Dinah Shad, while an habitation enforced, Mrs. Bathurst and a deal in cotton, would come in as pretty close seconds. But if you try the same experiment regarding O. Henry's stories, you will find a very different state of matters. Almost everyone present will have read him, and almost everyone will have his or own personal preference, backed up by reasons to justify it. Half of the time they will not remember the title. In spite of the pains that Mr. Porter is said to have taken over his titles, they are not of the kind that stick in the memory. Sometimes a good many of the details will have faded out. But what people remember is the sharp, unlooked-for twist at the end of the story, like the snap of a whip in a practiced hand. Do you remember, someone is sure to ask, that story of the local champion prize-fighter, who is just starting in on his honeymoon and whose bride expresses a wish for peaches? It is late at night, and even in New York, even in the ward where he is something of a power, peaches in the off-season are not easy to find. Everywhere he is offered oranges, big, thin-skinned, juicy oranges, but not a peach is to be found. At last he remembers a certain high-life gambling resort, where everything is done in lavish style, and where the buffet is never lacking in luscious hothouse fruits. Now, in all his devious career, he has stuck to his standards of loyalty, he has stood for a square meal among his kind. But tonight he is in a dilemma. His bride has demanded peaches, and peaches she must have, loyalty or no loyalty. Accordingly, he goes contrary to the ethics of his class, takes part in a police raid on the gambling house, and in the midst of a general rough-and-tumble fight, which is a gem of its kind, manages to make his escape with two rather dilapidated peaches. And now comes the snap of the whip. When he hands them to his expectant bride, she looks at them disappointedly and says, Oh, did I say peaches? It was oranges that I wanted. You haven't told that quite right, someone else rejoins. You don't emphasize the oranges enough. Don't you remember that everywhere he goes they say to him, Now, if it was only oranges you wanted, and at the last place he turns on them savagely and interrupts with, If anyone dares to say oranges again to me, I'll... And words fail him. But I'll tell you a story ever so much better than that, and that's the Jimmy Valentine one. There's a short story that really has some substance to it, a short story that had in it the material of a full-length play. Supposing you should give a story right to the following problem. Let the hero be a criminal, perhaps an escaped convict. Under another name, he has found honest employment in a town where his past is not known. He has won the respect of his new friends and the love of a good woman. His future seems assured. And suddenly, as he is in the act of destroying the only remaining evidences of the past, of cutting himself off even from the memory of his old life, fate brings him face to face with an extraordinary dilemma. Someone very close to the woman he loves is in danger of death, tragic and agonizing and it is only by revealing his crime-stained past, only by resorting to his criminal skill that he can save her. In other words, it is the man's reformation, his newly acquired tenderness of heart that is his undoing. There is the problem, and if you assigned it to a score of writers, I doubt if one of them would have got a quarter of the possibilities out of it that O. Henry did. That is all very well, objects someone else at this point. Jimmy Valentine was a good job of its kind, but he deliberately spoiled it at the end by one sentimental touch, the popular happy ending. We all know that in real life the detective who had spent weary months in tracking down an escaped convict would not let him go at last, with the tools of his trade in his hands, just because he cracked a safe in time to save a child from smothering. But if you want O. Henry at his best... Take a story like the one about the little girl whose mother didn't like that she should play in the street, and whose father, red-headed and sullen-tempered, spent his Sunday afternoon sitting by the window, in his shirt-sleeves and with his heels on the ledge, leisurely emptying a tin can of beer. "'Papa, won't you play checkers with me?' the little girl asks wistfully. 
No, I'm busy. Run along and play in the street, growls the man, and the little girl goes, in spite of the mother's feeble protest. I don't like that she should play in the street. Well, when we see that child again, a few years have passed. The street has done its worst for her, and she is in cruel trouble. The man whom she has loved too rashly openly favors another girl at a big east side dance hall. When, true to her street training, she draws a knife, stabs her rival, and ends her misery in the East River. The scene shifts from this world to the next. An angel of the heavenly detective corps has brought up for judgment the bedraggled soul of a poor drowned girl, and is proceeding to press the charge. Hold on, says St. Peter, or words to that effect. You have arrested the wrong person. The one you want to look for is a red-headed man in his shirt-sleeves drinking beer on Sunday out of a tin can. You'll lose your job if you aren't more careful. That's the fourth mistake you've made this week. There, in brief, we have a fairly wide and representative selection of O'Henry's stories. They do not pretend to include even a tithe of those one would like to mention if space allowed. Yet such as are here included show him pretty nearly at his best, wisely comprehensive of human foibles, indulgently ironic, yet with an underlying touch of sympathy that illumines and softens much that is sordid and commonplace. That he was a genuine artist cannot be questioned. That he was overrated by his own people and generation is more than possible. That the large element of what was local and temporal is likely to prove a heavy handicap in the race for immortality cannot be denied. As Anatole France sagely remarked, one must be light in order to fly across the ages. At all events, frankness demands recognition of the fact that O. Henry, while not limited to a narrow range, was not possessed of a conspicuously wide one. That he had already achieved enough on which to rest a substantial fame, and that it is doubtful whether, had he lived, he would ever have surpassed what he has already done. His early death has robbed us of the man but in all likelihood it did not seriously rob him of any laurels. End of chapter 10 Chapter 11 of Some American Storytellers by Frederick Tabor Cooper This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. 11. Gertrude Atherton it was in the Saturday Review which, about ten years ago, in discussing one of Mrs. Gertrude Atherton's novels, borrowed for its caption one of that author's own phrases, intellectual anarchy. The tone of the article in question was that of incisive irony and unkind cleverness. Nevertheless, this term, intellectual anarchy, may not unfairly be applied even by staunch admirers of Mrs. Atherton to a large part of her work and may serve conveniently as a sort of condensed explanation both of the degree of success she has achieved and of her failure to gain certain greater heights which seem to have lain so easily within her reach. Mrs. Atherton, it must be remembered, has had abundant opportunity for studying both life and literary methods in great extent and diversity. She knows and understands her native land from California, which has served as a luminous background for much of her best work clear to the eastern coast to Washington, the complex social strata of which she has given us in Senator North, to New York and Westchester County that she deftly satirized in Patience Sparhawk, to the Adirondacks that formed the setting for the trenchant irony of her aristocrats, and, on the other hand, she has spent a large portion of her recent years in Europe, imbibing new impressions and methods and also, it must be frankly admitted, yielding now and again to the temptation of laying in those foreign countries the scenes of several of her literary blunders. The net result of Mrs. Atherton's varied experiences and methods of self-training may be summed up as follows. That she has an uncommonly broad outlook upon life, an enviably rich equipment of material, and side by side with these advantages, a willful, almost illogical independence, a persistent rebellion against the bondage of literary schools. In short, a riotous freedom of style and construction that is not unfairly stigmatized as intellectual anarchy. Consequently, it is somewhat difficult to do strict justice to Mrs. Atherton's contribution to American fiction, somewhat difficult accurately to take the measure of her achievement, and while honestly pointing out wherein her shortcomings lie, to give her full credit for merits which have made her one of the forces that refuse to be disregarded in contemporary letters. 
In the first place, then, it is well to get clearly in mind the more obvious elements of strength in Mrs. Atherton's novels. She has the big advantage of seeing life with clear-eyed accuracy and without illusions. She is no idealist, inventing an imaginary world because the world of actuality happens at times to contain much that is sordid and painful. On the contrary, she faces unflinchingly the unpleasant truths of physical baseness and moral obliquity, mirroring them back with a fearlessness that compels recognition even from those who shrink from the naturalistic method. It is, of course, always rash to hazard a guess as to the source of any author's manner of procedure, but in the present case one ventures, with little fear of contradiction, the opinion that Mrs. Atherton owes to the French realistic school her interest in heredity, her frank treatment of the physical facts of life, and her unusually wise understanding of the complex relation in all big human emotions and impulses between the flesh and the spirit, and the impossibility of saying that hate and love, jealousy and self-sacrifice can ever be purely physical or purely psychic in their origin. She is right in constantly insisting upon the blending of the two in all the relations of men and women, and upon her fearless treatment of problems of sex rests her best title to be considered an important factor in fiction. With the possible exception of the author of Pigs in Clover, she is the only woman now writing in English who is able to handle questions of sex with a masculine absence of self-consciousness, and consequently with an absence of morbid exaggeration. But, on the other hand, Mrs. Atherton has not acquired, along with a continental frankness of speech, certain other qualities that are equally essential to the highest type of art, namely, a subtle nicety of construction, an appreciation of a finished technique. It is an inevitable consequence of her whole nature, her rugged independence, her refusal to be hampered by technicalities of the art, her fearless brushing aside of any arbitrary barriers standing between her and the way in which she happens, for the moment, to feel like writing a particular story, that almost without exception her books suffer from a faulty technique. Almost without exception we feel that the basic idea behind each of them, the skeleton structure upon which they were reared, was worthy and capable of a development considerably beyond that which she finally achieved. It needs no very great critical acumen, no special experience in the art of story construction to realize that in all of Mrs. Atherton's books there is a large proportion of episode that is not vital to the development of the central theme, that there are a certain number of minor characters devoid of real structural importance, that there are frequently secondary themes interwoven with the central one which constitute what might, in the hackneyed phraseology of Mr. Kipling, be accurately designated as another story, and in some cases these secondary themes, these subordinate characters which might have become structurally important if carried through to the final chapter, suddenly drop out of sight midway through the book, leaving us impotently wondering why they were introduced at all. Indeed, one of the most obvious faults of Mrs. Atherton's special brand of realism is that she imitates too freely nature's inscrutable way of injecting into the intimate dramas of human life a multitude of apparently irrelevant details. It is, of course, a common, everyday experience to find all sorts of sordid and paltry interruptions from the outside world, heedlessly intruding upon our intimate joys and sorrows. But there is no hard and fast rule ordaining the invariable occurrence of such interruptions, and the finer technique of fiction demands that their intrusion shall be reduced to a minimum. Otherwise, the main issue, the vital thing that the novelist has to say, runs the risk of becoming blurred, perhaps of being lost to sight altogether. One of the axioms of literary criticism is that an author shall be judged not merely by what he has done, but also by what has been the nature of his intention. The initial difficulty that lies in the way of fairly judging Mrs. Atherton is that it often becomes difficult to conjecture just what she really has intended to do. In several of her books, as we shall have occasion presently to observe in detail, she has apparently had in mind that epic breadth of subject and of treatment which characterizes the best work of Frank Norris, Robert Herrick, Ellen Glasgow, and David Graham Phillips, a big national problem filling the whole background of the canvas, and against it some sharply defined personal tragedy thrown out in bold relief in the middle of the picture. This, at least, one feels she has tried to accomplish, but she has fallen short of the accomplishment. The close connection between the general and the special theme, a connection that is vital to the achievement of any epic, whether in prose or in verse, is either wanting altogether or else too weak to fulfill its purpose. 
one sees, or rather half suspects, a number of symbolic characters and episodes planned apparently to develop and accentuate the epic scheme, but they are either abortive or else so obscure that one hesitates to venture an opinion as to what the author's intent really was, feeling moderately certain that, if consulted, she would probably declare that she had no such intent at all. Altogether, the literary methods of Mrs. Atherton may be summed up briefly as extraordinarily variable and arbitrary, and, nevertheless, perhaps indeed for this very reason, at times undeniably effective. It would be difficult to find in the whole range of English fiction another writer of such uneven quality, another writer whose best pages are separated from her worst by so wide a gap, whose strongest scenes are so vastly superior to her weakest, whose style at one time is so exceedingly good, and at others so exasperating to an ear that is sensitive to style. Mrs. Atherton, when at her best, is delightful in her ability to make us see. Her picturings of old California, which forms the background of so large a part of what must be recognized as her best work, possess an artistic charm, a sensuous richness of color, and at the same time a discreet self-restraint that constitute a delight to the ear and to the mental vision. Mrs. Atherton, at her worst, lets her pen run riot in a blare of words until the printed paragraph shrills onward and upward into a painful and hysterical shriek. Contrast, for instance, the following brief paragraphs taken almost at random from her earlier writings. Quote, Carmel River sparkled peacefully beneath its moving willows. The blue bay murmured to the white sands with a piece of evening. Close to the little beach, the old mission hung its dilapidated head. Through its yawning arches dark objects flitted. Mold was on the yellow walls. From yawning crevice the rank grass grew. Only the tower still defied elements and vandals, although the wind whistled through its gaping windows and the silver bells were no more. The huts about the church had collapsed like old mussels, but in their ruin still whispered the story of the past and in sharp contrast with the art of a delicate vignette like the above, compare such a riot of words and thought as the following. As she reached the sidewalk, a squall caught and nearly carried her off her feet. She cursed aloud. She let fly all the maledictions, English and Spanish, of which she had knowledge. She raised her voice and pierced the gale, the furious energy of her words hissing like escaping steam. She raised her voice still higher and shrieked her profane arraignment of all things mundane in a final ecstasy of nervous abandonment. It is this tendency to vociferate a little too shrilly, this inability to sustain the key, that suddenly has the effect of letting a whole scene drop from grim reality into something akin to melodrama. In spite of this, Mrs. Atherton compels admiration for her unwavering independence, her splendid strength when she is at her best, and for the rich glow and passion of pulsing life that she injects into the printed page, and that she undoubtedly would fall short of attaining with a less rugged and better disciplined style. A brief analysis of certain representative volumes will make clearer the scope and the limitations of Mrs. Atherton's attainments. To discuss in detail every one of the score of volumes which she has put forth during nearly as many years would not only be impracticable, but would seriously blur the resulting impression. But if we select, let us say, such volumes as The Californians, Patience Sparhawk, Senator North, Rulers of Kings and Ancestors, we shall have an easily manageable group that admirably shows her range of power, her chief interests in the problems of modern social life, as well as her methods and her errors of technique. Of Mrs. Atherton as a short story writer there seems no need to speak specifically. The splendid idle forties with its kaleidoscopic pictures of the life of old California, a life already vanishing into the realm of forgotten things has a quality that refuses to be disregarded. A quality of exotic beauty, an elusive fragrance, a strange mingling of pride and passion and languor. Yet the most that can be said of it is that it shows more of promise than of fulfillment, and that the best that it contains is to be met with again, worked out with a surer touch in her longer California novels. It is a little rash in the case of a novelist whose interests in life are so broad as Mrs. Atherton's, and whose point of view is so cosmopolitan, to attempt to find some unifying principle, some common keynote serving to harmonize her work as a whole. And yet, in Mrs. Atherton's case, such an attempt may be made with less danger than in the case of many of her contemporaries, of being accused of a far-fetched artificial interpretation. 
no one can read her books without being aware of the keen interest she has always taken in the spread of the modern democratic movement in our political social and moral attitude toward life and still more keenly is she concerned with the inevitable conflict constantly in progress between this younger stronger democratic movement and the inherited prejudices of an older aristocratic conservatism most of all she has chosen again and again with many minor variations to study the struggle of a young woman striving to readjust herself to the new order of things trying to conquer her own heredity to put aside the conventions in which she has been nurtured and to live her own life in independence and liberty this is the dominant note of senator north in which betty madison's long fight for happiness is the direct outcome of rebelling against the traditions of her family the iron-bound prejudices of her mother numbering themselves among the oldest and most exclusive families in washington they have made it their boast that no politician has ever been received within their doors betty in the prime of splendid young womanhood overrules her mother's wishes seeks the acquaintance of representatives and senators frequents the gallery of the senate chamber establishes a salon in which politics is the prevailing topic and to the destruction of her peace of mind falls in love with senator north realizing only too late that she has given her heart to a man already married the same note although not quite so insistent makes itself heard in the californians magdalena yorba is the daughter of a spanish father and a new england mother she is perpetually at war with herself constantly suffering from the clash between spanish pride and new england conscience between passive acceptance of that obedience to convention which the women of her father's house had always shown and that inborn sense of the individual right to live one's own life in one's own way which came to her through generations of puritan blood the particular way in which she asserts this independence seems not especially momentous in itself nor even vital to the structure of the story but it serves to keep before us her ineffectual spirit of revolt magdalena unlike the other girls of her social class has a restless brain thirsting for knowledge and for an opportunity to achieve and to create her secret ambition is to become an author but to don roberto yorba for a daughter of his house to essay to write is in itself an offence while to publish a book and allow her name to appear in print would be shame unspeakable the main theme of the story is only loosely connected with that of the girl's secret longing for a novelist's fame but it does have to do very distinctly with the repressed conditions under which magdalena has matured conditions that have handicapped her for the inevitable social game and make it possible for another girl reared in greater freedom to intervene and rob her of the man she loves. Patient Sparhawk fits in less well to the prevailing scheme of Mrs. Atherton's books. But at least it is the story of a young woman's struggle against heredity, against the evil impulses bequeathed her by her mother, the degradation of her mother's memory. And in the later development of the book we get, to some extent, the clash between the exclusive class and the democracy when Patient Sparhawk, wrongly accused of the murder of her husband, fights a losing battle for her life in court in the public press and even at the hands of the state governor partly because the evidence looks black against her but also as mrs atherton makes us feel because she is an aristocrat suffering judgment at the hands of the masses rulers of kings and ancestors among mrs atherton's later volumes are two books which it is most enlightening and salutary to study side by side for they reveal her respectively at her worst and at her best rulers of kings is a preposterous book a book of opera bouffe pure and simple a book of genius seemingly gone mad and running amuck through the palaces of europe ruthlessly trampling on the divine rights of kings and caricaturing the reigning monarchs in the spirit of a sunday supplement cartoonist it is distinctly depressing to have been under the necessity of reading so bad a book and what makes it not merely depressing but irritating as well is the conviction that mrs atherton is perfectly well aware of what she has done and that she has done it deliberately after much careful thought for the benefit of readers who may not happen to have read rulers of kings it may be worth while very briefly to state the sum and substance of it the book opens with the following paragraph quote, when fessenden abbott heard that he was to inherit four hundred million dollars he experienced the profoundest discouragement he was ever to know except on that midnight ten years later when he stood on a moonlit balcony in hungary alone with the daughter of an emperor and opened his contemptuous american mind to the deeper problems of europe 
A man equipped with a contemptuous American mind and four hundred million dollars may be relied upon to make some stir in the world. Fessenden Abbott's special way of getting into mischief is to fall in love with an Austrian princess, a daughter of the Emperor Franz Josef Renata by name, whom you will search for in vain in the Almanac de Gotha, for the simple reason that Mrs. Atherton invented her for the occasion. Now, if there is one court in Europe that is, more than any other, a stronghold of the divine right of kings, it is that of the Habsburgs, the one court where the marriage of a princess with an American is not merely a thing forbidden, but simply unthinkable, inconceivable, impossible. It is true that just once in the world's history a commoner did precisely this impossible, inconceivable thing, a dauntless firebrand of a man from Corsica. Had Napoleon never really lived, and had some audacious novelist of the Dumas type invented him, conceived his fantastic career, his juggernaut progress over the fallen thrones of Europe, then, by rights, we might have had a novel entitled to call itself Rulers of Kings. But Fessenden Abbott, with his contemptuous American mind, is sadly out of his element. When we listen to his stolen interviews with Renata, we wonder whether he is not a petty clerk who has taken his employer's daughter for a Sunday outing to Coney Island. Frankly, princesses do not talk that way. What happens in Mrs. Atherton's story is this. Fessenden Abbott possesses the rights to an invention which makes future warfare an impossibility. It is an explosive which starts in motion deadly whirlwinds that simply sweep out of existence any armed force venturing to stand in the way. Fessenden will sell his invention to Germany and Austria in exchange for Franz Josef's daughter. Then, as he points out, these two powers can declare war upon Russia and the East and wipe them out of existence. But if his offer is refused, he will instead sell the invention to Russia and to quote his ultimatum to Franz Josef. When Austria is a province of Russia, your daughter will be the first prisoner set free. The emperor's face turns purple, and his heavy Habsburg mouth trembles. But he capitulates and his daughter marries the American with the paternal blessing. The only point of spending so much space upon this literary blunder is to show that here, as elsewhere, Mrs. Atherton has the obsession of a triumphant democracy riding roughshod over Europe's proudest aristocrats. In contrast to this, it is like a breath of ozone to turn to ancestors, in which the same general theme is treated not merely with sanity, but with a bigness, a comprehension, a convincing force that make it easily the most important contribution she has yet made to American fiction. It is not surprising that she has put into it so much of her best work. She is writing not fantastic melodrama about comic opera kings, but plain truth about real people whom she may have known personally. She is showing sanely and convincingly the manner in which certain almost forgotten strains of heredity will come to the surface and assert their right to a share in working out our destiny. And lastly, she is picturing how the magic glamour of California may react upon a conservative Englishman, and little by little make a new man of him, until he ends by proving himself a better American than the Californians themselves. It is a big book, undeniably, a book of almost epic sweep a book whose power and value are likely in a measure to be missed if we do not realize that the protagonist is not Jack Gwynne, the Americanized Englishman, nor Isabel Otis, the California girl who wins his love, but the city of San Francisco, which dominates the book like a regal and capricious heroine, and whose hour of agony by earthquake and by fire closes the volume with the shadow of a cosmic tragedy. Nevertheless, even ancestors is faulty in technique. Mrs. Atherton was on the right track, as she had been many times before. San Francisco, the gateway of the West, the big and splendid symbol of American liberty, dominating the whole volume. And against this spectacular background, a little group of individual lives, handicapped by a complex heredity, slowly and bravely working their way to freedom and to happiness. Why, the book is built on a plan of Zola-esque magnitude and boldness. The trouble is that the two themes, the general and the specific, are not closely enough correlated. That many of the episodes which take place in San Francisco might just as well have been enacted elsewhere. And that even the tremendous final chapter, picturing the devastation of the great earthquake, is not a structural necessity, not a solution of any problem, nor a rounding out of the specific human story. The latter has been amply solved in an earlier chapter. 
and the earthquake is merely like the last piece played by the orchestra after the curtain has been rung down and the audience is filing out. One more example of what may be called slovenly technique is to be noted in one of the books already discussed, Senator North. Apparently, Mrs. Atherton had in mind in this case also a volume of epic breadth, with Washington and the whole scheme of national politics as the big, dominant general theme, and the love of an ardent young woman for one of the nation's lawmakers as the specific and individual point of interest. But here again the relation between the two themes is too loosely knit. We hear a good deal about political life. We frequent the houses of Congress, the homes of diplomats, the motley gatherings of public functions. But after all, the specific human interest of the book, the old, old story of a woman bravely fighting against her love for a married man, is independent of the political background, independent of party lines, independent even of the Cuban War with which the book concludes. As a story of two human lives, it would have been essentially the same had the setting been laid in no man's land outside of time and space. There is, however, one subordinate story interwoven in Senator North which, if it could have been made into a book apart, would have been an almost flawless bit of technique. This is the story of Betty Madison's half-sister Harriet, the illegitimate daughter of her father and an octoroon. Harriet is practically a white woman, but for a scarcely perceptible blueness at the base of her fingernails. The secret of her birth is well kept, and eventually she marries Betty's cousin, a southerner full of the pride of blood and race. The secret might have come out in any one of a dozen ways, but the way in which it does come out is structurally perfect. White though she is, Harriet inherits certain strains of Negro temperament, among others the sort of religious fervor that finds vent in revival meetings, loud hallelujahs, and gospel songs. And one night when she returns from a Negro camp meeting almost in a religious trance, she hysterically confesses to her husband the truth about the one-sixteenth strain of colored blood, too hysterical to foresee that he will inevitably kill himself and that her own suicide is the logical sequel. This character of Harriet is perhaps the best bit of feminine analysis that Mrs. Atherton ever did, and it is a pity that it is buried away in a volume where its importance is unfairly overshadowed by far less vital episodes. And now, briefly, what is Mrs. Atherton's place among the novelists of her time and generation? That she is a vital living force cannot be denied. That she has won and holds her public is also unquestionable. Much that she has done is well deserving of the recognition it has received. On the other hand, there is much in her writings that is indefensible. It is well, however, for the world of letters as a whole, in a generation when form and technique are in danger of being raised up as a fetish, to have now and then a fearless and untrammeled spirit, refusing to be bound by other laws and conventions than those of her own making, especially when she justifies herself from time to time by the sheer strength, the rugged sincerity of such books as the Californians and Ancestors. It is no bad thing for a nation's literature to be stirred now and again by the sort of intellectual anarchy that is represented by Mrs. Atherton at her best. End of chapter 11 Chapter 12 of Some American Storytellers by Frederick Tabor Cooper. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. 12. Owen Wister. No matter how willingly we may obey Candide's wise injunction to cultivate our garden, it is well to remember that not every writer can achieve an equal profusion and variety, nor an equal clearness of plan and purpose. Not to every one is it given to grow oranges and lemons, citrons and pistachios in oriental opulence. There are some literary gardens that bring with them an old-time fragrance of mignonette and sweet alisum, with sunflowers and hollyhocks in the background. Others again may be only an humble cabbage patch, or perhaps a garden of ala, all burning sand and sunshine, but born of singleness of purpose distinct and unmistakable. But how, at first sight, is one to interpret a garden composed of much sagebrush, one towering redwood, a magnolia, and a head of Boston lettuce? Yet this, in all courtesy be it said, is a fair inventory of the harvest which up to the present time has rewarded Mr. Wister's tillage in the fertile soil of his imagination. 
his short stories of western ranch life ranging from arizona to wyoming and comprising practically all his early work and an ample share of his later are literally as redolent of the soil as unmistakably indigenous in color form and atmosphere as is the gray-green aromatic herbage that forms so conspicuous a feature of their setting his one full-length novel the virginian has a certain primal bigness about it that makes it seem to loom up tree-like in rugged dignity a growth of nature rather than of art lady baltimore has by contrast a sort of hot-house charm that southern softness of manners and of speech as unmistakable and as delightful in their way as the form and fragrance of a magnolia bloom and even boston lettuce has not a flavor more local a more unsuspected generosity of close-packed and succulent substance than that blithe little satire of college life philosophy for with its unpretentious outward showing and the golden wisdom hidden at its heart yet it is precisely the informality of mr wister's garden the absence of neat paths and close-clipped hedgerows that gives the first important clue to his literary methods the simple fact is that mr wister has never attempted to preempt any special corner of the habitable world and make it his own in any such sense as mrs wilkins freeman preempted new england mr allen kentucky or mr cable new orleans the fact that he has become identified in the popular mind with certain sections of the west is due less to his interest in the life of the plains as something curious and anomalous something different from humanity as we ordinarily understand it than to his recognition of the far more important fact that underneath the picturesque and striking surface differences human nature west and east is at heart a fairly constant quantity his obvious love for the characters of his own creating scipio lemoyne and steve and the virginian is not because they were cowboys with a strange dialect and a still stranger moral code but because when one came to know them one found them men acting as the best of us might act if exposed to like conditions in this connection it is a significant fact that mr wister almost always writes frankly as an outsider bringing himself into the story after the method of mr kipling's earlier tales and writing in the first person as the one who has witnessed certain events or to whom certain others were repeated at first hand the result of this method is that we are all the time forced to see and measure whatever is local and transitory through alien eyes and that we think of such a book as the virginian not as the record of a phase of life that has already passed away but as a vital and enduring presentment of types and characters that are most thoroughly most widely most delightfully american after conceding freely and gladly these merits to mr wister it will not be thought ungenerous to proceed to point out some of his shortcomings and to say at once frankly that he is one of those story-tellers who have won fame not because of their craftsmanship but in spite of their lack of it to the fundamental doctrine of economy of means he shows a blithe indifference in his long stories and his shorter ones alike he refuses to trim his hedges or to prune back his vines preferring to let them luxuriate weed-like in whatever direction they list to some extent it is a handicap for an author to have a too facile charm of style the writer who is conscious that if he allows himself to become garrulous if he strays a hair's breadth beyond the strict letter of his theme he will be voted a bore learns at an early stage the fine art of suppression which emerson once declared to be the supreme quality of a literary style but the genial narrator who is assured of his hold upon his audience even when he rambles far afield with many a digression many a this reminds me is not likely to hamper himself with a rigid technique and thereby lose the chance of drawing forth an additional laugh or winning an extra round of applause this ability to digress with impunity mr wister has to an unusual extent even through the medium of the printed page one is always conscious of a pleasing personality and can almost see the indulgent smile or the amused twinkle of the eye that must accompany certain characteristic flashes of humour for there can be no question that besides being a story-teller the creator of emily and the frog's legs episode must be numbered among our recognised american humorists and what is more enrolled as one who has never for the sake of scoring a point degraded humour to the level of farce comedy now since an author is known by the company that he keeps upon his bookshelves or at least by that smaller group which he considers worthy of emulation it is worth while to pause for a moment over mr wister's own confessions in the preface to his latest published volume members of the family 
He tells us, for instance, that so far back as 1884, Mr. Howells had felt his literary pulse and pronounced it promising, that a quickening came from the pages of Stevenson, and a far stronger shove next from the genius of plain tales from the hills, and, oddly enough, that the final push happened to be given by Prosper Mérimée. All of these influences, with the exception of the last mentioned, are of course obvious enough to any clear-eyed critic. But it is interesting to know that they were influences of the conscious sort, and that Mr. Wister frankly recognizes his indebtedness. The influence of Mary May, however, is one that we might have been a long time in discovering without this direct acknowledgment. Yet the connection is sufficiently easy to perceive when one's attention has been directed to it. Mary May, like Wister, found his interest aroused and his imagination stimulated chiefly by new and foreign environments, as in his best-known stories, Colomba, Carmen, La Venus d'Ile, wherein he could study without criticizing the manner in which the fundamental problems of human nature work themselves out under the special limitations of Corsican or Spanish manners and customs. But his list of acknowledgments is not yet complete. There is one more to whom he professes a debt of gratitude, namely Henry James. And the heartfelt tribute that he proceeds to pay to the author of The Ambassadors is the best proof that, whatever his own shortcomings in technique may be, Mr. Wister's instinctive recognition of a master craftsman is beyond reproach. His own words in this connection deserve not only to be quoted, but cordially endorsed, because if more of our young novelists today had even a rudimentary idea of the amount that Henry James might teach them, American fiction would be less conspicuous for its prolificness and more conspicuous for its finer and higher standards. The influence is, as he points out, already at work, and slowly but surely it is bound to spread. Quote, it is significant to note how this master seems to be teaching a numerous young generation. Often do I pick up some popular magazine and read a story, one even of murder it may be in tropic seas or city slums, where some canny bit of foreshortening of presentation reveals the spreading influence, and I say, Ah, my friend, never would you have found out how to do that if Henry James hadn't set you thinking. But in authorship, for every one influence of which we are conscious, there are a dozen that work unguessed, unsuspected. And in Mr. Wister's case, had his acquaintances with modern fiction been limited solely to those authors to whom he pays tribute, a work like The Virginian, with all its faults, would be inconceivable. What the other influences have been, it is needless here to conjecture, for the sufficient and practical reason that his own admissions prove him to be of widely Catholic tastes, as free from attachment to any particular school as, let us say, was Marion Crawford. Howells, the veteran champion of realism, James, the subtlest of English psychologues, Stevenson, the belated romanticist, all find equal favor in his sight, not because of what they profess, but because he realizes that each of them achieves quite admirably the special thing that he has undertaken to do. In other words, Mr. Wister is an eclectic both in his theories and in his practice of fiction. It is impossible to pronounce him realist or romanticist, symbolist or psychologue. His methods vary not only from book to book, but from chapter to chapter in the same book. Maupassant, for instance, might have written more than one episode in The Virginian. The lynching of the cattle thieves, for instance, or that other even more cruel chapter in which a human fiend avenges himself upon a horse driven beyond its strength by gouging out its eye. But none but a dreamer could have written the idol of Molly's marriage to the Virginian and the honeymoon on the Sylvan Island, the only fault of which is that it was all too beautiful to be quite true. Having acquired this initial perspective of Mr. Wister's literary theory and practice as a whole, we may now profitably take up the separate works in detail, according to the division suggested by our opening symbolism of the garden. And first of all, as to the sagebrush portion of his work, the stories of rather uneven merit, ranging all the way from mediocre to extremely good, that made up the contents of such early volumes as Red Men and White and The Jimmy John Boss. Well, to be quite candid, a detailed analysis of them would add nothing of real value to a critical estimate of their author, because they are in a measure apprentice work. They were written while Mr. Wister was, in the phrase of the literary shop, learning his job. Had he never done anything better, The Jimmy John Boss, the opening story in the volume of that name, narrating how a cowboy whose sole education has been acquired in the school of adversity, 
and whose chief asset is his indomitable nerve is made foreman of the most lawless and undisciplined set of ruffians on any ranch in the state, takes them firmly in hand, and even after a temporary rebellion when they are crazed with drink, succeeds in getting back control and making himself undisputed master. All this and a dozen other tales would have merited a certain amount of critical praise. But, as it happens, they were merely an earnest of something far better yet to come. And in due time that something better came in the form of the Virginian, which in its genesis is nothing more nor less than an accretion of short stories, just as Maupassant's first novel, Une Vie, is an assemblage of short stories, and with the additional point of resemblance that in both cases a number of the stories have been published separately, in the case of the Virginian, several chapters having appeared in advance in magazine form. In that of Une Vie, the short stories being printed much later in a posthumous volume. The only practical purpose for recalling here what must be a rather widely known fact is that it serves to prove that Mr. Wister belongs to that class of storytellers whose natural form is the short story rather than the long, who see every story in the first instance as a single detached incident, and when they attempt a more sustained effort, find themselves simply stringing together a series of such incidents upon just one rather slender narrative thread. As it happens, the Virginian proved itself, in defiance of mathematics, to be considerably bigger than the sum of its parts. But that, I think, was due less to a definite, carefully worked-out plan than to a chance unity of ideas running through all the several segments. The West, as a broad, free, stupendous whole, had impressed Mr. Wister mightily, and in a way that could not be quickly formulated or easily put into words. But with each story, each episode, he came nearer to saying some part of what was struggling for utterance. And when all these separate parts were finally fitted together into a single volume, it would be interesting to know whether Mr. Wister himself was not just a trifle surprised to find how well he had succeeded in expressing a number of rather important truths. If it were not for the danger of being misunderstood as praising the Virginian for qualities which it does not possess, the simplest way of defining its character, and at the same time explaining why its very looseness of construction in some degree is a help rather than a hindrance, would be to say that it was of the epic type but the term would have to be understood in a far more elemental sense than when applied to the careful, almost architectural symmetry of the Zolaesque method. The Virginian is epic in so far as it shows us certain individual lives struggling to reach a solution of problems equally vital to the length and breadth of the whole vast region in which they live. A small group of human beings trying to justify to themselves and the world at large the fundamental justice of the rude moral code that governs them. In a stricter sense of the word, the Virginian is not merely badly constructed, it is almost without structure. There is not a chapter in it that we would willingly spare, but that does not alter the fact that, aside from a few crucial scenes, there is scarcely a chapter whose excision would destroy the book's essential unity. In other words, the book is so far of the picaresco type that its episodes are like so many pearls on a single thread. Undoubted gems of their kind, but so arranged that the removal of one or more would not leave a gap in the design. The Virginian has actually that lack of deliberate detail work for which so many critics wrongfully censure Mr. Kipling's Kim. Yet, if we are willing to think for a moment of the West, that glorious virgin West of earlier years, as a sort of anthropomorphized heroine, just as we think of India as the heroine of Kim, then it becomes possible to forgive much of the looseness, the apparent irrelevancy, the digressions, because much that is either superfluous or beside the mark, so far as it is meant to help us understand the individual lives of Molly or the Virginian, Steve or Trampas, becomes fraught with a new import when our interest is focused on the destiny of a community, almost on a nation. This bigger view of the Virginian is, of course, the true one. The individual life of any one cowpuncher, of no matter how much instinctive and inborn honesty and courage and deference to women, is not, for its own sake alone, material fine enough or strong enough from which to fashion a novel that could have taken the firm hold upon the general public, from the Atlantic to the Pacific, that the Virginian indisputably has taken. However lovable Mr. Wister's rough diamond of the ranches may be, and however sympathetically romantic his courtship of the demure little schoolteacher with a New England conscience, these ingredients alone would not have kept the book alive throughout the first six months. 
the secret of its enduring hold upon the public must be sought in something deeper and more vital. We find the answer, I think, in the broad general principle expressed here and there in words and throughout the book by implication that in every community men must make such laws for themselves as the conditions under which they live demand. The trick of getting the drop on your adversary, the right to shoot an enemy at sight after a fair warning, the whole underlying theory of vigilance committees and of lynch law are justified only by the exigencies of special conditions the advantage of the crudest and most rudimentary form of justice over no justice at all. Mr. Wister has not the least intention of holding lawlessness up for our admiration just because it comes in picturesque masquerade. When the Virginian cooperates in a murder, according to our Eastern standards, by helping to lynch his personal friend Steve, and when again he puts himself upon a level with a skulking outlaw like Trampas, accepts his challenge to shoot at sight, and succeeds in shooting straighter, Mr. Wister is not proclaiming the frontier code of Wyoming to have been superior to the English common law. He is simply insisting that if you or I are going to live in a community, we must accept the ethics of that community if we wish to be respected. He is exalting the hackneyed proverb about doing in Rome as the Romans do, from mere expediency, a mere courteous wish to do the expected thing, into a big fundamental principle of human rights and duties. And when Molly's New England conscience capitulates to love, and when after swearing she will never forgive the Virginian if he kills Trampas, she exclaims, Thank God! At the sight of Trampas's dead body, Mr. Wister is not to be misunderstood as claiming that Molly's moral nature has undergone a change, and that if she returned to her New England home, she would take with her a strain of newly acquired lawlessness. What he does teach is that she has acquired a wider horizon, a broader view of life, that she has suddenly been made to see that right and wrong are sometimes relative terms, and that what is a penal offense in Massachusetts may be the truest heroism among the Rockies. This same broad principle that every community, whether large or small, rude or cultured, knows better than any outsider can know its own interests and necessities, forms the cornerstone of Mr. Wister's best short story, Philosophy 4. And partly because it is his best short story, partly because it is replete with a far-sighted wisdom, partly also because it is in a class by itself, unique and inimitable, it has seemed worthwhile to give it in the present analysis of Mr. Wister's writings an amount of space that to some readers may seem out of proportion to its size and scope. There are many worthy persons who cherish the delusion that the percentages marked by solemn professors upon examination books are a fair criterion of the practical good which a student is obtaining from his college course, and that his precise standing in the graduating class is a reliable gauge of his future chances of success or failure. They are not aware that they are judging life from the standpoint of that venerable but somewhat misleading fable of the hare and the tortoise, and because some human hares have loitered by the wayside, and some human tortoises, dull, plodding, and industrious, have come in ahead, they take the result as a measure of relative speed throughout life. The undergraduate world makes no such blunders, and Mr. Wister, always felicitous in his subtle understanding of worlds and environments to which he bears the relation of an outsider, was never more delightfully, more triumphantly successful than in his tour de force, in which he bridged the years that separated him from his own Harvard days, and reflected the spirit of the time and place as only a Harvard man of the early eighties could have known and felt it but it would not be fair to imply that the merit of philosophy for is mainly local or temporal. In all the larger universities there are in every class certain students who are recognized as born leaders. In class politics, in athletics, in college journalism, in all that gives undergraduate life cohesion and unity, they come to the front. In the older New England universities they belong largely to the number of those whose fathers and grandfathers before them were prominent in the social life of their respective classes, and whose family names figure prominently in the pages of early American history. To such as these, a four years course at Yale or Harvard is enveloped in a maze of traditions undreamed of by the stranger and the alien. The university is not merely a seat of learning from which the maximum of knowledge must be extracted at a definite rate per day. It is a miniature world in which they are to find their level, just as they must find it later in the bigger world, 
and they are quite as much interested in finding out what their fellow classmates think of them as they are in winning the approval of the dean and faculty and in the long run the verdict of the undergraduate world is not greatly at variance with the later verdict of the world at large in other words philosophy for in spite of its joyously irresponsible mood emphatically points a moral although it may be in a somewhat topsy-turvy manner and incidentally it reflects undergraduate life with such fidelity that no harvard man of twenty-five years standing can read it without experiencing successive waves of nostalgia with the opening sentence it projects us at once into the sultry atmosphere of examination week with all its unforgotten sights and sounds and odors the fragrance of early june flowers wafted in at the windows the lazy droning of ponderous beetles blundering into the students lamps the distant singing of the glee club borne in from the steps of a dormitory across the yard within the room two anxious perspiring students bertie and billy are being prepared for an imminent examination in philosophy for by a fellow classmate whose name alone is a fairly sufficient characterization of race and attributes oscar myroni at the exorbitant sum of five dollars an hour bertie and billy are of the type of the grasshopper in la fontaine's familiar fable throughout the season of plenty they have played and sung oblivious of fate approaching in the form of the greek philosophers but suddenly the very names of aristotle and plato epicarmos of cos sent cold chills down their backs and they hastily seek out maroni the human ant and preempt a share of his stored-up knowledge now maroni is a type of student that will be readily recognized he is of the tortoise type patient plodding bound ultimately to attain his goal because a certain number of steps make a furlong and a definite number of furlongs make a mile his retentive memory absorbs the words of professorial wisdom after the fashion of a sponge and when examination day comes sponge-like he will squeeze it back again somewhat muddier and somewhat more scanty than when he received it yet essentially the same and without an added drop of originality over the two irresponsible spirits billy and bertie oscar labors faithfully sadly bewildered and somewhat pained by their lack of reverence for the sages of antiquity understanding only vaguely the rapid fire of their chaff and their slang but allowing himself no protest beyond a mildly sarcastic reference to their original research by seven o'clock on monday evening they have salted down the early greek bucks by midnight they have called the turn on plato tuesday night brings them down to the multiplicity of the ego the examination is set for thursday accordingly wednesday is dedicated to a general last survey of the whole subject as it happens wednesday morning dawns bright and clear a most alluring morning for a wild and irresponsible break for liberty the open country beyond the charles calls to them irresistibly there is besides a sort of tradition that somewhere in the direction of quincy there is a wonderful old tavern a mysterious elusive will-o'-the-wisp sort of place called the bird in hand where marvellous dinners and still more fabulous wines could be obtained if only one could find the place have you any sand bertie inquires of billy sand billy yells in response and within twenty minutes they are driving rapidly in the direction of quincy leaving oscar in the lurch and at this point mr wister subtly explains quote, you see it was oscar that had made them run so or rather it was duty and fate walking in oscar's displeasing likeness nothing easier nothing more reasonable than to see the tutor and tell him that they should not need him to-day but that would have spoiled everything they did not know it but deep in their childlike hearts was a delicious sense that in thus unaccountably disappearing they had won a great game had got away ahead of duty and fate it was a wild and exhilarating day that bertie and billy spent in pursuit of the elusive bird in hand they cooled themselves with a swim in the charles they lay on the bank and shouted at each other questions from greek philosophy turning it into a game by agreeing that each should credit himself with twenty-five cents whenever the other failed to answer correctly and finally when daylight was fading into dusk they stumbled unexpectedly upon the long-sought tavern thanks to the timely shying of their horse enjoyed an opulent repast in which silver fizz played a conspicuous part lost all conception of time and place and drove homeward by the waning light of the moon in such an exhilarated condition that when billy inadvertently tumbled out of the wagon over the wheel he had barely energy enough remaining to inquire who had fallen 
and when told to add in plaintive cadence, Did Billy fall out? Poor Billy! Now, by all the laws of probability, a night like this should have paved the way for a first-class failure in philosophy for, but it did nothing of the sort. Oscar, who had spent the previous day in calling with business-like punctuality once an hour at their room, and leaving memoranda to the effect that his services had been duly tendered, plodded through the three hours' examination with his wanted laborious fidelity, and received a modest seventy-five per cent as a reward for answering the professor's questions in the professor's own words. But Billy's mark was eighty-six and Bertie's ninety, and they were both highly complimented by the professor— Bertie, for his discussion of the double personality and his apt illustration of the intoxicated hack driver who had fallen from his hack and inquired who had fallen and then had pitied himself, and Billy, for his striking and independent suggestions concerning the distortions of time and space which hashish and other drugs produce. But the crowning touch of irony is attained in Oscar's unbounded astonishment, his inability to understand. Quote, he hastened to the professor with his tale. "'There is no mistake,' said the professor. Oscar smiled with increased deference. "'But,' he urged, "'I assure you, sir, those young men knew absolutely nothing. I was their tutor, and they knew nothing at all. I taught them all their information myself.' "'In that case,' replied the professor, not pleased with Oscar's tale-bearing, "'you must have given them more than you could spare. Good morning.' Before proceeding to point out that Lady Baltimore, Mr. Wister's next volume in point of time, is in spite of all the obvious differences of subject, setting, and workmanship, essentially the product of the same mind, the same philosophy, the same outlook upon life, it is necessary to clear up one or two possible misunderstandings regarding certain terms used in this chapter. There is, for instance, the statement that the Virginian is Mr. Wister's only sustained effort, his one full-length novel and to offset it is the indisputable fact that Lady Baltimore is issued in the conventional novel form, and contains upward of four hundred pages. Now, to suggest that broad margins and large type are potent factors in lending a deceptive impression of amplitude is merely to quibble over non-essentials. The difference between a short story and a novel lies deeper than a mere choice between eight and ten point type. The Virginian curtailed and compressed into fifty pages would still be a novel, because of the serious purpose and the tremendous human truths behind it. Lady Baltimore, regardless of mathematical dimensions, can never be in spirit anything more than an amplified novelette. Exquisite in workmanship, perennially charming in its presentment of an exotic and evanescent civilization, yet containing little in the way of broad generalities or of serious practical philosophy. Nevertheless, there is the further important truth that technically Lady Baltimore is the most admirable artistry, the most nearly flawless piece of work that Mr. Wister has yet achieved. Every conservative critic must deplore the rash extravagance of a certain type of reviewer who finds in the passing novel of today qualities worthy of comparison with Fielding and Thackeray, Balzac and Flaubert and Daudet. Even in Mr. Wister's case, it is at least over-generous to pronounce him, within the limits of a single review, a worthy successor both of Meredith and of Henry James. Yet this is precisely what Mr. Edward Clark Marsh, a critic characterized equally by the modesty and the discernment of his judgment, has done, at least by implication, in a review of Lady Baltimore. A possible indebtedness to the author of The Egoist we may well let pass, Considering how few novelists ever learn just where or how to begin or end a story, it is quite natural to attribute to the few who show intelligence in this respect a conscious imitation of one of the acknowledged masters. The influence of Henry James is a very different matter. In acknowledging his indebtedness to the author of what Maisie knew, in the preface already quoted, Mr. Wister goes on to say that he once had the privilege of going over one of his own books with Mr. James, and of having the latter point out, page by page, his shortcomings, his lost opportunities, his lack of that finished technique without which no amount of native genius can reach artistic perfection. Mr. Wister does not state which of his volumes was thus criticized, but one does not feel much diffidence in venturing the conjecture that it was the Virginian, and that Lady Baltimore was Mr. Wister's prompt acknowledgment of his indebtedness, as well as a demonstration of his surprising aptness as a pupil. For this reason, it is worth while to call attention to the critical acumen of Mr. Marsh's comment, 
anticipating as it did by five years Mr. Wister's confession. Quote, if there is a remote suggestion of Meredith in the elegant leisure of his beginning, there is a closer reference, a conscious indebtedness, indeed I believe, to Henry James in his manner, the turn of his phrases, and even in the framework and articulation of his story. All this is perfectly true, and the extraordinary thing about it is that, while in everything excepting the sheer craftsmanship of writing, Mr. Wister has followed his usual methods, there is nothing in the earlier volumes to show that Henry James ever before influenced him. In many respects, no doubt, their two minds must work in much the same manner, or Mr. Wister could never have found himself so quickly in sympathy with the veteran artist's technical methods. But so far as the outsider can discover, their newly revealed kinship is a matter of those more obvious questions of plot construction, point of view, the grouping of paragraphs, or the turn of a phrase. Accordingly, let us see first of all of what substance Lady Baltimore is made, and secondly, in what fashion and with what new manipulations Mr. Wister has chosen to mould that substance. As all readers of The Virginian are aware, its author has always insisted that although its pages contain no famous characters, and its date is so recent as to be practically contemporary, it is nevertheless a historical novel a record of a certain phase of American history caught and preserved during the actual making. In the same sense, both Philosophy for and Lady Baltimore are historical documents, representing eternal truths of human nature as reacted upon by transitory conditions. The setting of Lady Baltimore is a certain town of King's Port, a quiet backwater in the current of southern social life, where old-time manners and customs still linger and there is a fragrance of gentle dignity and bygone courtliness in the ordinary relations of life. Perhaps no story ever made claim to serious consideration while resting upon so fragile a foundation. Lady Baltimore is a local southern name for a certain rare and glorious species of cake, and the cake itself could not be of more airy and delicate consistence than the story it is here called upon to sustain. Imagine a northerner plunged by certain whims of destiny, the details are immaterial, into this tranquil eddy of an alien civilization, of whose social code he is utterly ignorant. Imagine him, while taking luncheon in the one available cake and tea room of the town, witnessing the purchase of a Lady Baltimore cake by a much embarrassed young man, who admits to the equally self-conscious young woman behind the counter that this cake, ordered for a day near at hand, is to serve at his wedding. In the embarrassment of the young man, the northerner sensed something unusual in the way of romance, and little by little he gleans the facts and pieces them together. The young man, it seems, has committed an act which his family and friends choose to regard as suicidal. He has engaged himself to a young woman of whose pedigree they know little or nothing. She may be a very worthy girl, but she is not one of them. She does not belong to the southern aristocracy. She is not a part and parcel of King's Port. Such, in brief, is the opening situation of Lady Baltimore. To give an adequate idea of the way in which the unyielding, indomitable force of local prejudice is brought to bear upon this young couple, how gossip twists and distorts and plays havoc with the actualities of the case, and how a number of destinies are forced out of their natural channels by the dead inertia of traditional social laws, would mean nothing less than to rewrite Lady Baltimore and to spoil it in the rewriting. In the Virginian, Mr. Wister succeeded in giving us a thoroughly virile book without brutalizing it. In Lady Baltimore, he has achieved the harder task of producing a delightfully feminine book without stooping to effeminacy. Or, to put it another way, he has juggled dexterously with soap bubbles without breaking them in the process. It remains to speak only of the technique of Lady Baltimore. It is no new thing to find Mr. Wister writing in the first person, but it is distinctly new to find him rigidly confining himself to that narrow segment of life that passes directly within the angle of vision of his spokesman, the northerner. This is the Henry James trick par excellence. Earlier novelists have sometimes done the same thing indifferently well, by instinct rather than intention, but Mr. James was the first to reduce this method to rules and the admirable consistency with which Mr. Wister has followed out this principle of a single viewpoint not only proves him to be an apt pupil, but makes Lady Baltimore one of those rare achievements in American fiction, a piece of technique that is almost without a flaw. 
it is a regrettable fact that Mr. Wister, never a prolific author, seems to be writing with an ever-decreasing momentum. It is so long since a new volume has appeared bearing his name that there is a half-hearted effort to hail as a literary event the recent appearance of members of the family, in which he has gathered together the later stories of the West, which from time to time he has contributed to the magazines. In all candor, it must be admitted that the majority of them are rather lightweight. A few are frankly humorous, as, for instance, Happy Teeth, in which the easily aroused superstition of Indians is cleverly utilized to drive out a new post-trader who has acquired monopoly through unfair means, or again in the back, in which a hasty, although perhaps well-merited kick, delivered by an army captain to one of his men, becomes the subject of serious investigation and infinite red tape, and is finally paid in full with accumulated interest. But the stories that deserve to be remembered are Timberline and The Gift Horse. Imagine yourself a tenderfoot, unskilled in the ways of the West, and without the clues that would help you to read character. Imagine that you have done a kindness to a man who is locally eyed askance, and that he, to mark his gratitude, has insisted upon lending you a splendid specimen of a horse for the season. It might or it might not strike you as peculiar that before giving you the horse he should inquire so particularly as to your plans, and get your definite statement that you will remain throughout the summer on a certain side of a certain mountain range. Imagine, furthermore, that you suddenly change your mind and cross that range in quest of a certain legendary spring, which, according to Indian tradition, has a way of strangely appearing and disappearing. You find the spring, and simultaneously find an enclosure wherein there are many horses, stolen horses with fresh brands not yet healed. At your very feet lie a pile of branding irons. And before you can collect your thoughts, you are looking into the muzzle of a pistol, and find yourself surrounded by a company of ominously quiet men, one of whom carries a coil of hempen rope. These men do not care to listen to explanations. They simply cite the significant fact that you are here, that the branding irons are here, and that the horse you ride is a stolen one. Such is the awkward predicament narrated in The Gift Horse, and there is a grim little touch at the end which completes its artistry. But even stronger than this is Timberline. For sheer economy of means and a steady rise in dramatic force to the culminating tragedy, it stands as easily the best story in the collection indeed one of the best that Mr. Wister has ever written. It is simply the account of a man, little more than a boy, who, having been the unintentional instrument of a murder, has accepted a bribe to remain silent, and slowly, inexorably, has found himself dragged back by conscience to the scene of the crime, forced under the spell of an extraordinary and awe-inspiring convulsion of nature to make confession, restore the money, and by his spectacular death, Reveal the hiding place of the other victim at the bottom of a canyon a thousand feet below. An old idea, elemental in its simplicity, but, like many of the world's big stories, owing its value to a finished workmanship, an unerring instinct for telling neither too much nor too little. In his earlier work, as we have already seen, Mr. Wister cared little about the rules of form. His strength lay in his ability to hold the attention, whether he shortened up a story or unduly prolonged it. In other words, he told his stories in a certain form, not because it was the best form, but because it happened for the moment to be his form, the form that came instinctively. The most interesting thing about this new volume is that it shows that he is continuing to practice, as he first learned to do in Lady Baltimore, a more careful, more conscious method of construction. Mr. Wister has possessed from the first the valuable assets of sincerity, force, and broad popular appeal. And, above all, he has always had something to say that was eminently worth the saying. Now that he has added to these qualities of finer artistry, it is to be hoped that his lessened productiveness is not due to an impoverished soil, but to a wise economy that deliberately lets land lie for a season fallow. End of chapter 12《ハッピーバーサマーカッピーバーサマーカッピーバーサマーカッピーバーサマーカッピーバーサマーカッピーバーサマーカッピーバーサマーカッピーバーサマーカッピーバーサマーカッピーバーサマーカッピーバーサマーカッピーバーサマーカッピーバーサマーカッピーバーサマーカッピーバーサマーカッピーバーサマーカッピーバーサマーカッピーバーサマーカッピーバーサ
and clarifying his ideas upon literature and life in a series of essays entitled Salt and Sincerity. There have been so many changes in American fiction during these intervening ten years. So many younger reputations have waxed and waned that the work of Norris, taken as a whole, has been thrown into an unjust and misleading remoteness. We are apt to think of him as belonging to a bygone generation, as an influence which after showing a brief potentiality suddenly withered once and for all. As a matter of fact, Norris's influence has never for an hour been dead. In a quiet, persistent way, it has spread and strengthened, leavening all unsuspectedly the maturer work of many of the writers who have since come into prominence. And the best way in which to realize the nearness of Norris, in point of time and of spirit, as well as the dormant strength which his early death prevented from ever fully awakening, is to glance back and briefly consider some of the conditions of American fiction at the time when he began to write. During the closing years of the nineteenth century, or, to be more specific, from 1897 to 1902, the period of Norris's activity, there were easily a score of new writers who leaped suddenly into prominence on the strength of a single book. The volumes that come casually to mind and may be regarded as fairly representative are Winston Churchill's Richard Carville, Robert Herrick's Gospel of Freedom, Mrs. Wharton's The Greater Inclination, Booth Tarkington's Gentleman from Indiana, Brand Whitlock's Thirteenth District, George Horton's Long Straight Road, Theodore Dreiser's Sister Carrie, Morgan Robertson's Spun Yarn, Harry Leon Wilson's The Spenders, Owen Wister's The Virginian, Jack London's Son of the Wolf. The list might be stretched to twice the length. In glancing over this array of names, the various associations and contrasts they offer strike one today as exceedingly odd. Certain of these reputations seem now curiously stunted. Certain others loom up unexpectedly large. But in spite of the unforeseen readjustments that time has wrought, the significant fact remains that Norris in his lifetime dwarfed them all. At the time of the appearance of The Octopus and The Pit, there was not a single volume produced by this younger group, with the possible exception of the Virginian, that even approached them in breadth of view or bigness of intent. And when we measure the ten years' growth in individual cases, when we compare the promise of the gospel of freedom or the greater inclination with the accomplishment of Together or the House of Mirth, then the fact is suddenly forced home to us how much greater growth that same ten years would have shown in the best craftsman and the bravest, biggest soul of them all. One realizes now that even in his last and maturest books, Norris had not fully found himself, that he was still in the transition period, still groping his way tirelessly, undauntedly toward self-knowledge. He had adopted the creed of naturalism ardently, refashioning it to suit the needs of a younger, cleaner civilization, a world of wider expanses, purer air, freer life. And even while he wrought, he witnessed the apparent downfall of that very creed in the land of its birth, saw its disintegration beneath the hands of its chief champion. It is impossible to read Norris's works without perceiving that from first to last there was within him an instinct continually at war with his chosen realistic methods, an unconquerable and exasperating vein of romanticism that led him frequently into palpable absurdities, not because romanticism in itself is a literary crime, but because it has its own proper place in literature, and that place is assuredly not in a realistic novel. How this inner warfare would eventually have worked out, what compromises, innovations, iconoclasms would have paved the way to full maturity of accomplishment, it is of course impossible now even to guess. But one thing is certain. Norris would have found that way, and when found, it would have proved not merely big, rugged, compelling, but also clean as the opened windswept spaces that he loved, and fine as gold that has no dross. The expressed views of any novelist on the principles of his art have a value far out of proportion to their critical acumen. We may agree or not with Marion Crawford's The Novel, What It Is, or with Maupassant's preface to Pierre et Jean, with Zola's Roman Experimental, or The Art of Fiction, by Henry James. Their principles may be quite right or quite wrong. The important fact in each case is that they have betrayed to us the principles in accordance with which they themselves wrought. They have given us penetrating searchlights into the secrets of their methods, the sources of their strength and their weakness. This is why, in a critical examination of the writings of Frank Norris, his collected essays entitled The Responsibilities of the Novelist not only cannot be ignored, but form the natural and obvious starting point. 
it is well to add quickly that these essays will serve merely as a starting point and nothing more. If they were the measure of Norris's value, if they represented not only what Norris believed that he was trying to do but what he actually succeeded in doing, he would be of considerably lesser magnitude and his influence would have ended long before this. They are exceedingly uneven, some of them revealing a surprisingly deep and far-reaching understanding of the methods and purposes of serious fiction, while others again show nothing excepting certain curious personal limitations, a sort of mental astigmatism. In a number of them, such as A Problem in Fiction, one feels that Norris was not so much telling the general public the views that he had long and clearly held, but rather that he was making interesting exploration trips into his own mind and trying by a tour de force to reconcile the contradictory instincts and impulses that he encountered there. It may be said in passing that these essays contain some curiously bad writing to come from the pen possessing the strength and brilliance and lyric quality of Norris at his best. It seems almost as though he were saying, This is not my real work, it is only a side issue. I cannot stop to worry about form and style. All I want to do is to convey the idea with sufficiently comprehensible journalistic fluency. I am in a hurry to get back to my new big novel, the biggest and the best I have ever done. This was quite literally Norris's attitude towards fiction in general and his own in particular. The novel to him was the literary form of supreme importance, the most potent and far-reaching. Quote, the pulpit, the press, and the novel. These indisputably are the great molders of public opinion and public morals today. But the pulpit speaks but once a week. The press is read with lightning haste and the morning news is waste paper by noon. But the novel goes into the home to stay. It is read word for word. It is talked about, discussed. Its influence penetrates every chink and corner of the family. How necessary it becomes, then, for those who, by the simple art of writing, can invade the heart's heart of thousands whose novels are received with such measureless earnestness. How necessary it becomes for those who wield such power to use it rightfully. Is it not expedient to act fairly? Is it not, in heaven's name, essential that the people hear not a lie, but the truth? Such was Norris's firm conviction regarding the modern novel, an instrument of vast and at times dangerous power, and the novelist's responsibility he looked upon as a solemn trust. He had only scorn for writers who shifted and spun around like weathercocks to meet the wind of popular favor, and he insisted that the true reward of the novelist, the reward that could not be taken away from him, was to be able to say at the close of his life, I never truckled. I never took off the hat to fashion and held it out for pennies. By God, I told them the truth. They liked it or they didn't like it. What had that to do with me? I told them the truth. I knew it for the truth then, and I know it for the truth now. The essay on The Novel with a Purpose is the sanest, wisest, most important chapter in this volume. It shows how thoroughly Norris understood the principles of epic structure in fiction how faithfully he had learned the one big lesson that Zola had to teach, and how wisely he had taken to heart the warning contained in the great Frenchman's later blunders. The novelist's purpose is to his story what the keynote is to the sonata. Though the musician cannot exaggerate the importance of the keynote, yet the thing that interests him is the sonata itself. In like manner the purpose in a novel is important to the author only as a note to which his work must be attuned. The moment that the writer becomes really and vitally interested in his purpose, his novel fails. And Norris proceeds to illustrate this strange anomaly by imagining Hardy writing a sort of English germinal, setting forth the wrongs of the Welsh coal miners. Quote, it is conceivable that he could write a story that would make the blood boil with indignation. But he himself, if he is to remain an artist, if he is to write his novel successfully, will, as a novelist, care very little about the iniquitous labor system of the Welsh coal miners. It will be to him as impersonal a thing as the key is to the composer of a sonata. Now all this is absolutely right. Indeed, so simple and elemental an axiom of structure that one wonders why, at the close of the nineteenth century, it was still necessary to put it into words at all why it was that even the unthinking general reader could not feel instinctively the fatal inferiority of Mrs. Humphrey Ward to Zola. 
the inferiority for that matter of all the frenchman's work subsequent to le docteur pascal to almost all his work preceding it yet as a matter of fact even norris himself did not perceive this truth in its fullness until after the appearance of fecondite he had not seen how far astray zola had already drifted in paris he did not see that he himself in the octopus was being drawn into the same disastrous current but he did see later in time to show in the pit the dawn of a new light and that is why the following quotation is not merely a reiteration of the point already made about hardy and the welsh miners but has an interest all its own quote, do you think that mrs stowe was more interested in the slave question than she was in the writing of uncle tom's cabin her book her manuscript the page-to-page -page progress of the narrative were more absorbing to her than all the negroes that were ever whipped or sold had it not been so that great purpose novel never would have succeeded consider the reverse fecondite for instance the purpose for which zola wrote the book ran away with him he really did not care more for the depopulation of france than he did for his novel result sermons on the fruitfulness of women special pleading a farrago of dry dull incidents overburdened and collapsing under the weight of a theme that should have intruded only indirectly it is rather painful to turn from the broad sanity of views like these views that norris arrived at through his intellect to certain others that he reached through his emotions such for instance as his views upon romantic fiction if we have ever had a writer in this country who owes every last atom of importance that is in him to the realistic creed that writer is frank norris and for that reason it sounds like the basest kind of ingratitude to find him speaking of that harsh loveless colourless blunt tool called realism the plain truth is that norris never understood in any of their accepted senses the meaning of the terms romance and realism at the time when a man's woman was still running serially in the san francisco chronicle and the new york evening sun norris said in a letter to a critic who had objected to his exasperating vein of romanticism for my own part i believe that the greatest realism is the greatest romanticism and i hope some day to prove it in a plea for romantic fiction he gave the following topsy-turvy irrational irresponsible definition Quote, romance i take it is the kind of fiction that takes cognizance of variations from the type of normal life realism is the kind of fiction that confines itself to the type of normal life according to this definition then romance may even treat of the sordid the unlovely as for instance the novels of m zola zola has been dubbed a realist but he is on the contrary the very head of the romanticists now norris might just as well have defined white as that pigment which we use to paint the rare and precious things of life and black as that which we choose for all common everyday things cups and saucers table linen wheelbarrows and cobblestones shoe polish he might have added is generally considered black but really it is the most dazzling of all possible varieties of white this sort of thing is definition run mad errant nonsense leading nowhere there are several perfectly legitimate definitions of the two chief creeds in fiction any one of which norris might have adopted any one of which would have been intelligible to the public at large there is for instance that very simple distinction drawn by marion crawford making realism a transcript of life as it is and romance of life as we would like it to be but norris is right in one thing realism and romance do exist side by side everywhere and all the time where he missed the truth is in this that the difference between the two is not one of material fact of a different series of episodes but simply of a different attitude of mind two people can look at a sunset and one of them may say with what magic trickery has nature's brush decked out the heavens with a new and marvellous colour scheme and the other may with equal right reply the refraction of solar radiation through a finely attenuated aqueous vapour does produce some rather pretty effects you have a perfect right to go into raptures over the infinite power of creation which produced niagara falls but the man who didn't see what prevented the water from tumbling over was equally within his rights and he was a pretty good realist water itself may be looked at romantically as the god neptune or realistically as h two o 
and if you cannot see that the chemical fact is the greater wonder of the two, then there is no use in trying to convert you. Frank Norris was of the number of those whom it was hopeless to try to convert. He could not or would not understand that while a novelist has a perfect right to look upon life either literally or imaginatively, he has not the right to do the two things simultaneously. There is a character presented almost at the outset of the octopus, a poet by the name of Presley, who admirably illustrates the chief shortcoming of Norris's work. He is haunted by the dream of writing an epic of the West. His ambition is to paint life frankly as he sees it, yet, incongruously enough, he wishes to see everything through a rose-tinted mist, a mist that will tone down all the harsh outlines and crude colors of actuality. He is searching for true romance, and instead finds himself continually brought up against the materialism of railway tracks and grain elevators and unjust freight tariffs. All this is of interest to us, not because Presley is an especially important or convincing character, but because he is so obviously introduced as a means of stating once again the author's topsy-turvy theory that realism and romanticism are convertible terms and that the epic theme for which Presley is vainly groping lies all the time close at hand could he only see it, not merely in the primeval life of mountain and of desert, the shimmering purple and gold of a sunset, but in the limitless stretch of steel rails, the thunder of passing trains, the whole vast intricate mechanism of organized monopoly. Now, of course, there is an epic vastness and power in many phases of our complicated modern life, and the only possible way in which to handle them adequately is by using a huge stretch of canvas and blocking them in with broad, sweeping, Zolaesque brush strokes. But epic vastness has no logical connection with Romanticism. Its very essence lies in some huge, all-pervading, symbolic figure, some personified idea, seen vaguely in the background behind a closely woven web of human actualities. Here and there, it may be, the seeds of romance will take root and spring up, in spite of all precaution, like tares among the wheat. And they are inevitable in the case of a writer who, like Norris, has a tender indulgence for the tares. This was his pet failing, his besetting sin. A curious paradox when one stops to consider how wonderfully clear the greater part of the time his vision was. He knew in his inmost soul that what counts most in honest workmanship is fidelity to life the real, actual life as it is lived day by day by average, commonplace human beings. It still remains true, he once wrote, that all the temperament, all the sensitiveness to impressions, all the education in the world will not help one little, little bit in the writing of a novel if life itself, the crude, the raw, the vulgar, if you will, is not studied. And in this respect he practiced what he preached, studying the crude, the raw, the vulgar doggedly adhering to the blunt truth, never softening or palliating a thought where he conceived it essential to the fidelity of his picture. Occasionally, his very imagery verged upon coarseness, as where he described the ships along the city's waterfront. Their flanks opened, their cargoes, as it were, their entrails spewed out in a wild disarray of crate and bale and box. And what magic effects this fearlessness of words produced! How prodigiously Norris succeeded in making us see! There have been few novelists who could vie with him in the ability to sketch the physiognomy of some mean little side street in San Francisco, to picture with a few telling strokes some odd little Chinese restaurant, to make us breathe the very atmosphere of McTeague's tawdry, disordered, creosote-laden dental parlor, or the foul, reeking interior of Bennett's tent on the ice fields of the far north. And yet, Every now and again, this same acute, clear-visioned writer would perversely sacrifice not only truth, but even very similitude for the sake of a melodramatic stage effect, even at the risk of an anticlimax worthy of Dickens, as Mr. Howells has characterized the closing scene in McTeague. When a friend once expostulated with Norris for the gross improbability of that chapter in which a murderer, fleeing from justice into the burning heat of an alkali desert, carries with him a canary that continues to sing after thirty-six hours without food or water, he frankly admitted the absurdity, but said that he had been unable to resist the temptation, because the scene offered such a dramatic contrast. Besides, he added whimsically, I compromised by saying that the canary was half dead anyhow. Norris's debt to Zola, already referred to, is too obvious to have need of argument. 
everywhere from his earliest writings to his last in one form or another it stares us in the face compelling recognition like zola his strength lay in depicting life on a gigantic scale portraying humanity in the mass like zola he could not work without the big underlying idea the dominant symbol in mcteague the symbol is gold the most fitting emblem he could devise to personify the state of california the whole book is flooded with a shimmer of yellow light we see it in the floating golden disk that the sunlight through the trees casts upon the ground in the huge gilded tooth of the densest sign in the lottery prize which trina wins in the polish jew zirkov the man with the rake groping hourly in the muck heap of the city for gold for gold for gold in the visionary golden dishes of maria macapa's diseased fancy a yellow blaze like fire like a sunset and again in the hoarded coins on which trina delighted to stretch her naked limbs at night in her strange passion for money the coins which finally lured mcteague and his enemy to their hideous death in the alkali desert in the epic of the wheat as we shall see more specifically when we come to examine the octopus in detail the central symbol had become an even vaster more relentlessly dominant element a single state no longer satisfied him what he wanted was a symbol which would sum up at once american life and american prosperity his friends are still fond of telling of the day when he came to his office trembling with excitement incapacitated for work his brain seething with a single thought the trilogy of the wheat i have got a big idea the biggest i ever had was the burden of all he had to say for many a day thereafter another obvious debt that norris owed to the creator of les rougeaux macquart is his style the swing and march of phrase and sentence the exuberant wealth of noun and adjective the insistent iteration with which he develops an idea expanding and elaborating and dwelling upon it forcing it upon the reader with accumulated synonym and metaphor driving it home with the dogged persistence of a trip hammer here is a passage which brief as it is admirably illustrates this quality Quote, outside the unleashed wind yelled incessantly like a sabbath of witches and spun about their pitiful shelter and went rioting past leaping and somersaulting from rock to rock tossing handfuls of dry dust-like snow into the air folly-stricken insensate an enormous mad monster gambling there in some hideous dance of death capricious headstrong pitiless as a famished wolf and again in accordance not only with zola but with the entire continental school of realism norris delights in dwelling upon the physical side of life with the exception of the pit the characters in his books are none of them possessed of an over-refinement of sentiment they are normal human beings with a healthy animality about them rugged rough-hewn men and dauntless self-sufficient women he dealt by preference with primitive natures dominated by single passions his favorite heroes are cast in a giant mold big of bone and strong of sinew with square-cut heads and a salient prognathous jaw such was captain kitchell in moran of the lady letty such also was mcteague Quote, a young giant carrying his huge shock of blond hair six feet three inches from the ground moving his immense limbs heavy with ropes of muscle slowly ponderously his hands were enormous red and covered with a fell of stiff yellow hair his head was square-cut angular the jaw salient like that of the carnivora bennett also in a man's woman is of the same brotherhood Quote, his lower jaw was huge almost to deformity like that of a bulldog the chin salient the mouth close gripped the great lips indomitable brutal the forehead was contracted and small the forehead of men of single ideas and the eyes too were small and twinkling one of them marred by a sharply defined cast in dealing with women it was norris's wont to paint pleasanter pictures but here too he dwelt mainly on physical attributes he never wearied of describing their features the color of their hair and eyes the fragrance of their neck and arms their whole sweet personality it is curious to see what a fascination woman's hair seems to have had for norris it fairly haunted him like an obsession he dwelt upon it constantly lingeringly it is the one great charm of each and all of his heroines they are forever smoothing it braiding it putting it up or down 
it enters into and lends color to their every mood. Moran Sternison has an enormous mane of rye-colored hair, which, whipped across her face and streamed out in the wind like streamers of the northern lights. Travis Bessemer in Blix, trim and trig and crisp as a crack yacht, also has yellow hair, not golden nor flaxen, but plain, honest yellow, sweet yellow hair rolling from her forehead. Lloyd Seawright in A Man's Woman has auburn hair, a veritable glory, a dull red flame that bore back from her face in one grand solid roll, dull red like copper or old bronze, thick, heavy, almost gorgeous in its somber radiance. Even small, delicate, anemic Trina McTeague has heaps and heaps of blue-black coils and braids, a royal crown of swarthy bands, a veritable sable tiara, heavy, abundant, odorous. All the vitality that should have given color to her face seemed to have been absorbed by this marvelous hair. But it is not alone the redolence of woman's hair on which Norris likes to dwell. His pages diffuse a veritable carnival of odors. McTeague's dental parlors give forth a mingled odor of bedding, creosote, and ether. In Blix the Chinese quarter suggests sandalwood, punk, incense, oil, and the smell of mysterious cookery. Here again is the fragrance of the country in midsummer. Quote, During the day the air was full of odors, distilled as it were by high noon. The sweet smell of ripening apples, the fragrance of warm sap and leaves and growing grass, the smell of cows from the nearby pastures, the pungent ammoniacal suggestion of the stable back of the house, and the odor of scorching paint blistering on the southern walls. And as a companion piece to the foregoing, here is an unsavory little paragraph giving a glimpse of the starving occupants of a wind-buffeted tent in the Arctic regions, a paragraph redeemed only by the dramatic suggestion of the closing words. Quote, the tent was full of foul smells, the smell of drugs and of moldy gunpowder, the smell of dirty rags of unwashed bodies, the smell of stale smoke, of scorching sealskin of soaked and rotting canvas that exhaled from the tent cover. Every smell, but that of food. One does not have to read far into Norris before discovering the strong underlying note of primevalism in him, the undisguised delight that he took in pointing out that, in spite of our boasted civilization, la bête humaine is still rather close to the surface, our veneer of conventionalism sadly thin. He welcomed eagerly the nature revival in literature. Mr. Seaton and his school opened a door, opened a window, and more literature has given place to life. The sun has come in, and the great winds, and the smell of the baking alkali on the Arizona deserts, and the reek of the tarweed on the Colorado slopes. And nature has become a thing intimate and familiar and rejuvenating. In his own books he preferred, wherever possible, to isolate his men and women, to get them away from the artificiality of pink teas and ballrooms, and set them face to face with the open sky and their own passions. He delighted in the great reach of the ocean floor, the unbroken plain of the blue sky, and the bare green slope of land, three immensities gigantic, vast, primordial, scenes wherein the mind harks back unconsciously to the broad, simpler basic emotions, the fundamental instincts of the race. He was nearly always at his best when describing the elemental, unchanging aspects of nature, the golden eye of a tropic heaven, the unremitting gallop of unnumbered multitudes of grey-green seas, the remorseless scourge of the noon sun in the desert waste of Death Valley where the very shadows shrank away hiding under sage bushes, and all the world was one gigantic blinding glare, silent, motionless. Better than any of these is the following picture of the limitless desolation of the Arctic ice fields. Quote, in front of the tent and over a ridge of barren rock was an arm of the sea, dotted with blocks of ice, moving silently and swiftly onward, while back from the coast and back from the tent and to the south and to the west and to the east stretched the illimitable waste of land, rugged, gray, harsh, snow and ice and rock, rock and ice and snow, stretching away there under the somber sky, forever and forever, gloomy, untamed, terrible, an empty region, the scarred battlefield of chaotic forces, 
the savage desolation of a prehistoric world. Such, in brief, are the materials and the methods of Norris's art as a novelist. Big words, big phrases, big ideas, an untrammeled freedom of self-expression. He could not be true to himself if hampered by a narrow canvas. That is why it is as incongruous to look to Frank Norris for short stories as it would be to set the Rodin to carving cherry pits or a Vera Schagen to tinting lantern slides. Yet it does not follow that the short tales rescued from the magazine files and collected under the title A Deal in Wheat were not worth preservation. On the contrary, they are full of keen interest to the student of fiction. No one but Norris could have written them. Every page testifies to the uncrushable vitality of the man. But to call them short stories is to misname them. They impress one as fragments, rather splendid fragments, trials of the author's strength before he launched forth upon more serious work. Take, for instance, the opening story which gives the title to the volume. It was palpably written for practice, a sort of five-finger exercise in preparation for Norris's last volume, The Pit and from this point of view it possesses a definite interest. But taken as a story, it is at once too long and too short. He attempted to cover altogether too much ground. He might, with advantage, have brought it to a conclusion some pages sooner. And yet, when the end is reached, there remains a sense of incompleteness. In the whole collection there is just one story that stands out unique and forceful, a memorandum of sudden death. This memorandum is a fragment of a journal supposed to be written by a wounded soldier, one of a small company of troopers who have been relentlessly trailed, day after day, by a band of hostile Indians through desolate miles of sand and sagebrush until the final attack is made. If we agree to overlook the improbability of the whole thing, if we grant that a man with one or two bullets in him, and with his comrades all dead or dying on the ground beside him, could go on recording passing events with the accuracy, the minuteness, the astounding atmosphere of this story, then we must admit that it is Norris's nearest approach to the artistic unity of the short story form. Of Norris's longer stories, Moran of the Lady Letty was the first to don the dignity of print, although the greater part of McTeague antedated in point of actual composition. It is a fact not generally known that the nucleus of McTeague was submitted as part of the required theme work during Norris's period of postgraduate study at Harvard University and that it was conscientiously elaborated and polished for four years before it was finally given to the public. Moran, the author's one frankly romantic story, was dashed off in an interval of relaxation. Its swift popularity suggested that an easy avenue to fortune lay open to him, for Norris had a lively gift for stories of the blood-and-thunder order, and often entertained his friends by reeling off extemporized sword-and-buckler plots by the yard. But from the beginning he took fiction too seriously to debase it, and even Moran has a certain primitive bigness about it, a rhythm of northern runes, a spirit of ancient sagas. There are whole chapters conceived with reckless disregard of plausibility, but that does not make it any the less a strong, fresh ideal of the sea, full of the dash of waves and the pungency of salt breezes, full also of health and vitality and clean hearts, and amply redeemed by the brave, frank, loyal character of that daughter of a hundred Vikings, Moran herself. It is probable that in this volume Norris had no underlying motive, no central idea beyond the wish to tell the story, and yet one likes to think that, consciously or unconsciously, he embodied in Moran his ideal of the muse of fiction, the spirit of the novel of the future. Listen for a moment to his own description of this spirit as given in one of his later essays. Quote, she is a child of the people, this muse of our fiction of the future, and the wind of a new country, a new heaven and a new earth is in her face, and has blown her hair from out the fillets that the old world muse has bound across her brow, so that it is all in disarray. The tan of the sun is on her cheeks, and the dust of the highway is thick upon her buskin, and the elbowing of many men has torn the robe of her, and her hands are hard with the grip of many things. She is hail fellow well met with every one she meets, unashamed to know the clown, and unashamed to face the king, a hardy, vigorous girl, with an arm as strong as a man's, and a heart as sensitive as a child's. Read these words once again, and ponder on them. Then go back to Moran of the Lady Letty, 
and to see if you do not find in it a hitherto unguessed amplitude, a gladder sense of the joy of living, a deeper pathos in the absolute right, the artistically inevitable tragedy with which it ends. Of McTeague almost enough has been said already. It is the most frankly brutal thing that Norris ever wrote. Its realism is as unsparing as D'Annunzio's, though its theme is cleaner. It is a remorseless study of heredity and environment, symbolizing the greed of gold and dominated throughout by the gigantic figure of the dull and brutish dentist, ox-like, ponderous, and slow. Necessarily, it is a repellent book. And yet there is about it that curious attraction which certain forms of ugliness possess when they attain a degree of perfection amounting to a fine art. McTeague does not begin to show the breadth of purpose or the technical skill of the octopus or the pit. Yet there are times when one is tempted to award it a higher place for all-around excellence. There is a better balance between the central theme and the individual characters, or, to state it differently, between the underlying ethics and the so-called human interest. If Norris had never written another book, he would still have lived in McTeague, just as surely as George Douglas Brown still lives in the house with the green shutters. Blix, which came next in point of time, offers a sharp, even an astonishing contrast. It is a sparkling little love story, clean and wholesome, the chronicle of an unconscious courtship between a young couple who begin by agreeing that they do not love each other, and then try the dangerous experiment of attempting to be simply and frankly good friends. There is an effervescence, an irrepressible bubbling up of youthful spirits, a naive good comradeship, quite free from the embarrassment of sex consciousness, all of which gives to the volume a special piquancy of actuality. One feels that if it were possible to ask Frank Norris a few leading questions about Blix, he would have answered as Marion Crawford answered a propos of the three fates, and with something of the same wistfulness. The fact is, I put a good deal of myself into that book. A Man's Woman is of all Norris's novels the nearest approach to a failure the one that shows the greatest gulf between purpose and accomplishment. The central figures are an Arctic explorer whose heart is divided between two passions, love and ambition, and a woman, a grand, noble man's woman, strong enough to subordinate her own love for him to the furtherance of that ambition, the discovery of the North Pole. The story abounds in strong situations of an intensity often bordering on the repellent, and the convincing pictures of helpless, isolated humanity, agonizing amidst the desolate ice plains of the far north, cannot fail to win an honest even though grudging recognition. But the book as a whole is keyed a trifle too high. It is overweighted with too ponderous words and phrases, with too tense and too sustained a pressure of emotions. One feels that people could not go on living and keep their sanity if life were such a constant blare of passions, such a crude, raw presentment of primitive humanity, born out of time, the Stone Age transferred to the twentieth century. And yet, like all of Norris's works, it has its lure, its compelling force. We will not open the book again, we will not read another line. And yet, wait a moment, our eye has just caught another passage. Listen to this. Quote, there were six of them left, huddled together in that miserable tent. Their hair and beards were long and seemed one with the fur covering their bodies. Their faces were absolutely black with dirt, and their limbs were monstrously distended and fat, fat as things bloated and swollen are fat. It was the abnormal fatness of starvation, the irony of misery, the huge joke that Arctic famine plays upon those whom it afterwards destroys. The men moved about at times on their hands and knees, their tongues were distended, round and slate-colored, like the tongues of parrots, and when they spoke they bit them helplessly. Here, in a single paragraph, we have the domithos of his earlier volumes. They have less of the primordial and the titanic in their composition, and considerably more of the average everyday foibles and weaknesses. One feels that somehow and somewhere he had gained a deeper insight into the hearts of the men and women about him and that this was what Owen Wister had in mind when he wrote, In the pit Norris has risen on stepping stones to higher things. And yet the pit is just as much a structural part of the whole design of Norris's trilogy as was the octopus. It has that same inherent epic bigness of theme, a gigantic attempt to corner the entire world's supply of wheat, to force it up, 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 
and hold the price through April and May and June, and then finally the new crop comes pouring in and the daring speculator is overwhelmed by the rising tide. A human insect, impotently striving to hold back with his puny hand the output of the whole world's granaries. Such are the books which Norris, with feverish impatience and tireless nervous energy, produced in the few short years that fate allotted him. They stand today as the substructure of a temple destined never to be finished, the splendidly rugged torso of a broken statue. That is the way, the best, the truest, the only way in which to think of Norris's place in American fiction as only a partial fulfillment of a rarely brilliant promise. Had he lived to attain his full stature, there is small doubt that he would have given us bigger, stronger, more vital novels than the younger American school has yet produced. End of chapter 13chapter 14 of Some American Storytellers by Frederick Tabor Cooper this LibriVox recording is in the public domain. 14. Ambrose Bierce In the preface to the fourth volume of his collected works, the volume containing under the title of Shapes of Clay the major portion of purely personal satiric verse, Mr. Ambrose Bierce emphatically expresses his belief in the right of any author to have his fugitive work in newspapers and periodicals put into a more permanent form during his lifetime if he can. No one is likely to dispute Mr. Bierce's contention, but it is often a grave question how far it is wise for the individual to exercise his inalienable rights. And in the case of authors, the question comes down to this. How far is it to their own best interests to dilute their finer and more enduring work with that which is mediocre and ephemeral? For it is unfortunately true that no author is measured by his highlights alone, but by the resultant impression of blended light and shade and there is many a writer among the recognized classics who today would take a higher rank had a kindly and discriminating fate assigned three-quarters of his life work to a merciful oblivion to the student of american letters however the comprehensive edition of ambrose bierce's writings recently issued in ten portly and well-made volumes cannot fail to be welcome it places at once within convenient reach a great mass of material which good, bad, or indifferent, as the case may be, all helps to throw suggestive sidelights upon the author, his methods, and his outlook upon life. It forces the reader who perchance has hitherto known Mr. Beer solely as a master of the short story to realize that this part of his work has been throughout a long and busy life, a sort of side issue, and that the great measure of his activities has been expended upon social and political satire and similarly those who have known him best as the fluent producer of stinging satiric verse suddenly recognize how versatile and many-sided are his literary gifts the ten volumes are divided as follows three volumes of prose fiction two volumes of satiric verse two volumes of literary and miscellaneous essays and three volumes consisting mainly of satiric prose including a greatly amplified edition of that curiously caustic piece of irony the Cynic's Word Book, now for the first time published under the title of Mr. Bierce's own choosing, The Devil's Dictionary. It seems, therefore, most convenient to consider Mr. Bierce the man of letters under three separate aspects, the critic, the satirist, and the master of the short story. Regarding literary criticism, Mr. Bierce says quite frankly, the saddest thing about the trade of writing is that the writer can never know, nor hope to know, if he is a good workman. In literary criticism, there are no criteria, no accepted standards of excellence by which to test the work. Now, there is just enough truth in this attitude of mind to make it a rather dangerous one. If there were literally no accepted standards in any of the arts, no principles to which a certain influential majority of critical minds had given their adhesion, then literature and all the arts would be in a state of perennial anarchy. But, of course, any writer who believes in his heart that there are no criteria will necessarily remain in lifelong ignorance regarding his own worth. For it is only through learning how to criticize others sanely and justly that one acquires even the rudiments of self-criticism. And, incidentally, it may be observed that no better proof of Mr. Bierce's fundamental lack of this valuable asset could be asked than the retention in these ten volumes of a considerable amount of journalistic rubbish side by side with flashes of undoubted genius. 
Mr. Bierce's entire essay on the subject of criticism is a sort of literary agnosticism, a gloomy denial of faith. He has no confidence in the judgment of the general public nor in that of the professional critic. He admits that, in a few centuries, more or less, there may arrive a critic that we call posterity. But posterity, he complains, is a trifle slow. Accordingly, since the worth of any contemporary writer is reduced to mere guesswork, he, Ambrose Bierce, has scant use for his contemporaries. He has very definite ideas regarding the training of young writers and tells us at some length the course through which he would like to put an imaginary pupil, but he adds, quote, If I caught him reading a newly published book, save by way of penance, it would go hard with him. Of our modern education he should have enough to read the ancients, Plato, Aristotle, Marcus Aurelius, Seneca, and that lot custodians of most of what is worth knowing. In spite of the pains to which Mr. Bierce goes to deny that he is a laudator temporis acti, the term fits him admirably, and nowhere is this attitude of mind more conspicuous than in his treatment of the modern novel. It is important, however, to get clearly in mind the arbitrary sense in which he uses the word novel as distinguished from what he chooses to call romance. His occasional half-definitions are somewhat confusing but apparently by the novel he means realistic fiction, as distinguished from romantic fiction, a distinction complicated by the further idiosyncrasy that by realism he understands almost exclusively the commonplaces of actuality, and by romanticism any happening which is out of the ordinary. The novel, then, in his sense of the word, is a snow plant. It has no root in the permanent soil of literature, and does not long hold its place. It is one of the lowest form of imagination. And again, the novel bears the same relation to literature that the panorama bears to painting. With whatever skill and feeling the panorama is painted, it must lack that basic quality in all art, unity, totality of effect. He seems utterly unaware that the great gain in modern fiction, the one indisputable factor that separates it from the fiction of half a century ago, is precisely the basic quality of unity. The modern novel whose technique most nearly approaches perfection is the one which when read rapidly with a virgin attention at a single sitting, to borrow Mr. Bierce's own phrase, gives an impression of as single-hearted a purpose as one finds in the most faultless of Maupassant's three-thousand-word masterpieces. It is quite possible for any well-trained reader to go through even the longest of novels at a single sitting. The present writer would feel himself grievously at fault if he interrupted his first reading of any novel that had been given him for the purpose of review, and he well remembers that in only two recent cases did he become conscious of the prolonged strain, namely Mr. Kipling's Kim, which required an uninterrupted attention of eight and one-half hours, and The Golden Bowl of Mr. James, which required somewhat more than eleven. Mr. Bierce's attitude, however, is partly explained by his obiter dictum that no man who has anything else to do can critically read more than two or three books in a month, and of course if you are going to allow an average of ten days to a book, the most perfect unity of purpose is inevitably going to drop out of sight. All of this helps us to understand how it happens that Mr. Bierce, otherwise a man of intelligence, can say in all seriousness that, in England and America, the art of novel writing is as dead as Queen Anne. Listen also to the following literary blasphemy. Quote, so far as I am able to judge, no good novels are now made in Germany, nor in France, nor in any European country except Russia. The Russians are writing novels which, so far as one may venture to judge, are in their way admirable, full of fire and light, like an opal. In their hands the novel grew great, as it did in those of Richardson and Fielding, and as it would have done in those of Thackeray and Pater if greatness in that form of fiction had been longer possible in England. Or again, quote, Not only is the novel a faulty form of art, but because of its faultiness it has no permanent place in literature. In England it flourished less than a century and a half, beginning with Richardson and ending with Thackeray, since whose death no novels probably have been written that are worth attention. Think for a moment what this means. Here is a man who has ventured to speak seriously about the modern novel, and who confessedly is unaware of the importance of Trollope and Meredith and Hardy, of Henry James and Rudyard Kipling, and Maurice Hewlett, 
and who deliberately ignores the existence of Flaubert and Maupassant and Zola, Galdos and Valdez, Verga and D'Annunzio. It is not astonishing after that to find Mr. Beer seriously questioning the value of epic poetry. What more than they gave, he asks, might we not have had from Virgil, Dante, Tasso, Camoines, and Milton, if they had not found the epic poem ready to their misguided hands? The fact is that Mr. Bierce, as a critic, is one of the iconoclastic variety. He breaks down but does not build up. He has no patience with the historical form of criticism that traces the intellectual genealogy of authorship, showing, for instance, Maupassant's debt to Poe or Bourget's debt to Stendhal. He is equally intolerant of that analytical method, the fairest of them all, that judges every written work by its author's purpose as nearly as this may be read between the lines. Nothing is more certain, he says, than if a writer of genius should bring to his task the purposes which the critics trace in the completed work, the book would remain forever unwritten to the unspeakable advantage of letters and morals. Yes, he tears down the recognized methods of criticism, but suggests nothing better in their place. And when he himself undertakes to criticize, it is hardly ever for the purpose of paying tribute to excellence, with the noteworthy exception, mirabile dictu, of his extraordinary praise of George Sterling's poetic orgy of words, The Wine of Wizardry. Tolstoy, for instance, he defines as a literary giant. He has a giant's strength and has unfortunately learned to use it like a giant, which means not necessarily with conscious cruelty but with stupidity. The journal of Marie Baskirtseff, the last book on earth that one would expect Mr. Beers to discuss, he sums up as morbid, hysterical, and unpleasant beyond anything of its kind in literature. Among modern critics he pronounces Mr. Howells the most mischievous because the ablest of all this sycophantic crew. The truth is that the value of Mr. Beers as a critic lies solely in his fearlessness and downright sincerity, his unswerving conviction that he is right. He has, to a rather greater extent than many a better critic, the quality of consistency and no matter how widely we are forced to disagree with his conclusions, there is not one of them that does not throw an interesting sidelight upon Mr. Beers, the man. The short stories and the serious critical papers of Mr. Beers have appeared in a spasmodic and desultory way, but from the first to last he has been at heart a satirist of the school of Lucilius and Juvenal, eager to scourge the follies and the foibles of mankind at large. The fact that Mr. Beers is absolutely in earnest, that he is destitute of fear and confessedly incorruptible, accounts for the oft-repeated statement that he was for years the best-loved and the most hated man on the Pacific coast. Now, the ability to use a stinging lash of words is all very well in itself. It is a gift that is none too common. But to be effective it must not be used too freely. The two ample volumes of Mr. Beers's poetical invectives form a striking object lesson of the wisdom in Hamlet's contention that unless you treat men better than they deserve, none will escape a whipping. And when fresh from a perusal of the contents of shapes of clay and black beetles and amber, one has become so accustomed to seeing men flayed alive that a whole skin possesses something of a novelty. Now there is no question that there is a good deal wrong with the world, just as there always has been, if one takes the trouble to look for it. But when any one man takes upon himself the task of reprimanding the universe, it is not unreasonable that we should ask ourselves in the first instance, what manner of man is this? What are his standards and beliefs? And if he had his way, what new lamps would he give us in place of the old? In the case of Mr. Beers, it is a little difficult to make answer with full assurance. Somewhere in his preface he has said that he has not attempted to classify his writings under the separate heads of serious ironical, humorous, and the like, assuming that his readers have sufficient intelligence to recognize the difference for themselves. But this is not always easy to do, because in satire these different qualities and moods overlap each other, so that there is always the danger of taking too literally what is really an ironical exaggeration. Here, however, is a rather significant passage taken from a serious essay entitled To Train a Writer. It sets forth the convictions and the general attitude toward life which Mr. Beers believes are essential to any young author before he can hope for success. And it is only fair to infer that they represent his own personal views. Quote, he should, for example, forget that he is an American and remember that he is a man. 
he should be neither Christian nor Jew nor Buddhist, nor Mahometan nor snake worshipper. To local standards of right and wrong he should be civilly indifferent. In the virtues so called, he should discern only the rough notes of a general expediency. In fixed moral principles, only time saving predecisions of cases not yet before the court of conscience. Happiness should disclose itself to his enlarging intelligence as the end and purpose of life, art and love as the only means to happiness. He should free himself of all doctrines, theories, etiquettes, politics, simplifying his life and mind, attaining clarity with breadth and unity with height. To him a continent should not seem wide, nor a century long. And it would be needful that he know and have an ever-present consciousness that this is a world of fools and rogues blind with superstition, tormented with envy, consumed with vanity, selfish, false, cruel, cursed with illusions, frothing mad. Now this strikes the average fair-minded person as a rather wholesale indictment of what on the whole has proved to be a pretty good world to live in. In fact, it is difficult to conceive of any one honestly and literally holding so extreme a view, and yet of his own volition remaining in such an unpleasant place any longer than the time required to obtain the amount of gunpowder or strychnine sufficient for an effective exit. But of course Mr. Beers does not find life half so unpleasant as he professes. In fact, he gives the impression of hugely enjoying himself by voluntarily looking out upon a world grotesquely distorted by the lenses of his imagination. He has, of course, a perfect right to have as much or as little faith as he chooses in any human religion or philosophy, moral doctrine or political code. Only it is well when studying Mr. Beers as a satirist and reformer to understand clearly his limitations in this respect and to discount his view accordingly. It is well, for instance, to keep in mind, when reading some of his scathing lines directed at small offenders, who at most have left the world not much worse off for having lived in it, that Mr. Beers once eulogized that wholesale destroyer of faith, Robert Ingersoll, as a man who taught all the virtues as a duty and a delight, who stood as no other man among his countrymen has stood, for liberty, for honor, for good will toward men, for truth as it was given him to see it. To the present writer there is much that is keenly irritating in Mr. Beers's satiric verse for the reasons above implied. It is, of course, highly uncritical to find fault with a writer for no better reason than because you find yourself out of harmony with his religious and moral faith or his lack of it, for an author's personal beliefs should have no bearing upon the artistic value of what he produces. But putting aside personal prejudice, it may be said in all fairness that Mr. Bierce made a mistake in giving a permanent form to so large a body of his fugitive verses. It is not quite true that satiric poetry is read with the same interest after the people at whom it was directed are forgotten. Aristophanes and Horace and Juvenal cannot be greatly enjoyed today without a good deal of patient delving for the explanation of local and temporal allusions. And in modern times, Pope's Dunciad, for instance, is probably today the least important and the least read of all his writings. It is impossible to take much interest in vitriolic attacks made twenty years ago upon various obscure Californians, whose names mean nothing at all to the world at large. But on the other hand, anyone can understand and enjoy the sweeping irony as well as the sheer verbal cleverness of a parody like the following. Quote, a Rational Anthem My country, tis of thee, sweet land of felony, of thee I sing. Land where my fathers fried young witches and applied whips to the Quaker's hide and made him spring. My knavish country thee, land where the thief is free, thy laws I love. I love thy thieving bills that tap the people's tills. I love thy mob whose wills all laws above. Let federal employees and rings rob all they please the whole year long. Let office holders make their piles and judges rake our coin. For Jesus' sake, let's all go wrong. One is tempted to devote considerably more space than is warranted to that extremely clever collection of satiric definitions, the Devil's Dictionary. It represents a deliberate pose consistently maintained. It is pervaded with the spirit of what a large proportion of readers in a Christian country would pronounce irreverent. It tells us nothing new and can hardly be conceived of as an inspiration for higher and nobler living but it is undeniably entertaining reading. 
almost any one must smile over such specimens as the following taken almost at random. Monday, noun. In Christian countries, the day after the baseball game. Bacchus, noun. A convenient deity invented by the ancients as an excuse for getting drunk. Positive, adjective. Mistaken at the top of one's voice. But it is a writer of short stories that Mr. Bierce's future fame rests upon a firm foundation. It is not too much to say that within his own chosen field, the grim, uncompromising horror story, whether actual or supernatural, he stands among American writers second only to Edgar Allan Poe. And this is all the more remarkable when we consider his expressed scorn of new books and modern methods, and his implied indifference to the development of modern technique. He does understand and consciously seeks for that unity of effect which is the foundation stone of every good short story. Yet in sheer technical skill there is scarcely one among the recognized masters of the short story today, Mr. Kipling, for instance, and the late O. Henry, Jack London and a score of his contemporaries, from whom he might not learn something to his profit. What Mr. Bierce's habits of workmanship may be, the present writer does not happen to know. It is possible that he has always striven as hard to build an underlying structure, a preliminary scaffolding for each story as ever Edgar Allan Poe did. But if so, he has been singularly successful in practicing the art which so artfully all things conceals. He gives the impression of one telling a story with a certain easy spontaneity and attaining his results through sheer instinct. He seldom attempts anything like a unity of time and place and many of his short tales have the same fault which he criticizes in the modern novel, namely that of having a panoramic quality of being shown to us in a succession of more or less widely separated scenes and incidents. Nevertheless, in most cases his stories are their own best justification. We may not agree with the method that he has chosen to use, but we cannot escape from the strange haunting power of them, the grim boding sense of their having happened, even the most weird, most supernatural, most grotesquely impossible of them, in precisely the way that he has told them. The stories, such of them at least as really count and represent Mr. Bierce at his best, divide themselves into two groups. First, the Civil War stories, based upon his own four years' experience as a soldier during the rebellion, and unsurpassed in American fiction, for the unsparing clearness of their visualization of war. And, secondly, the frankly supernatural stories contained in the volume entitled Can Such Things Be? Stories in which the setting is immaterial because if such things could be, they would be independent of time and space. The war stories range through the entire gamut of heroism, suffering, and carnage. They are stamped in all their physical details with a pitiless realism unequaled by Stendhal in the famous Waterloo episode in the Chartreuse de Parme, and at least unsurpassed by Tolstoy or by Zola. Indeed, there is nothing fulsome or extravagant in the statement that has more than once been made that Mr. Bierce is a sort of American Maupassant. And what is most remarkable about these stories is that they never fail of a certain crescendo effect. Keyed as they are to a high pitch of human tragedy, there is always one last turn of the screw, one crowning horror held in reserve until the crucial moment. Take, for example, A Horseman in the Sky. A sentinel, whose duty it is to watch from a point of vantage overlooking a deep gorge and a vast plain beyond, to see that no scout of the southern army shall discover a trail down the precipitous sides of the opposite slope, suddenly perceives a solitary horseman making his way along the verge of the precipice within easy range of fire. The sentinel watches and hesitates, takes aim and delays his fire. The scene shifts with the disconcerting suddenness of a modern moving picture, and we see the sentinel back in his southern home at the outbreak of the war. And we overhear the controlled bitterness of his parting with his southern father, after declaring his intention to fight for the Union. A modern storyteller would consider this shifting of scene bad art. Nevertheless, Mr. Bierce, in theatrical parlance, gets it over. Back again he shifts us with a rush to the lonely horseman, shows him for a moment motionless upon the brink, and the next instant launched into space a wonderful, miraculous, awe-inspiring figure, proudly erect upon a stricken and dying horse, whose legs spasmodically continue their mad gallop throughout the downward flight to the inevitable annihilation below. This in itself, 
told with Ambrose Bierce's compelling art, is sufficiently harrowing, but he has something more in reserve. Listen to this. Did you fire? The sergeant whispered. Yes. At what? A horse. It was standing on yonder rock, pretty far out. You see, it is no longer there. It went over the cliff. The man's face was white, but he showed no other signs of emotion. Having answered, he turned away his eyes and said no more. The sergeant did not understand. See here, Druce, he said after a moment's silence. It's no use making a mystery. I order you to report. Was there anybody on the horse? Yes. Well? My father. And again there is that extraordinary tour de force entitled An Occurrence at Owl Creek Bridge. It is the story of a spy caught and about to be hanged by the simple expedient of allowing the board on which he stands to tilt up and drop him between the cross-beams of the bridge. The story is of considerable length. It details with singular and compelling vividness what follows from the instant that the spy feels himself dropped, feels the rope tighten around his neck, and its fibers strain and snap under his weight. His plunge into the stream below, his dash for life under cover of the water, his flight, torn and bleeding, through thorns and brambles, his miraculous dodging of outposts and his passing unscathed through volleys of rapid fire, all read like a hideous nightmare. And so, in fact, they are, because the entire story of his rush for safety lasting long hours and days in reality is accomplished in a mere fraction of time, the instant of final dissolution, because, as it happened, the rope did not break, and at the moment that he thought he had attained safety, his body ceased to struggle and dangled limply beneath the Owl Creek Bridge. Variations upon this theme of the rapidity of human thought in the moment of death are numerous. There is, for instance, a memorable story by Morgan Robertson called If Memory is Not at Fault, from the main top, in which a lifetime is crowded into the fraction of time required for the action of gravity but no one has ever used it more effectually than Mr. Bierce. But it is in his supernatural stories that Mr. Bierce shows even more forcefully his wizardry of word and phrase, his almost magnetic power to make the absurd, the grotesque, the impossible carry an overwhelming conviction. He will tell you, for instance, a story of a man watching at night alone by the dead body of an old woman. A cat makes its way into the room and springs upon the corpse and to the man's overwrought imagination it seems as though that dead woman seized the cat by the neck and flung it violently from her. Of course you imagined it, says the friend to whom he afterwards tells the tale. I thought so too, rejoins the man, but the next morning her stiffened fingers still held a handful of black fur. For sheer mad humor there is nothing more original than the tale called A Jug of Syrup. A certain old and respected village grocer, who through a lengthy life has never missed a day at his desk, dies and his shop is closed. One night, the village banker and a leading citizen on his way home drops in from force of habit at the grocery, finding the door wide open, and buys a jug of syrup, absent-mindedly forgetting that the grocer who serves him has been dead three weeks. The jug is a heavy weight to carry. Yet, when he reaches home, he has nothing in his hand. The tale spreads like wildfire through the village, and the next night a vast throng is assembled in front of the brightly lit-up grocery, breathlessly watching the shadowy form of the deceased methodically casting up accounts. One by one they pluck up courage and make their way into the grocery, all but the banker. Riveted to the spot by the grotesque horror of the sight, he stands and watches while pandemonium breaks loose. To him in the road the shop is still brilliantly lighted, but to those who have gone within it presents the darkness of eternal night, and in their unreasoning fear they kick and scratch and bite and trample upon one another with the primordial savageness of the mob. And all the while the shadowy figure of the dead grocer continues undisturbed to balance his accounts. It is a temptation to linger beyond all reason over one after another of these extraordinary and haunting imaginings such, for instance, as Moxon's Master, in which an inventor, having made a mechanical chess player, makes the mistake of beating it at the game and is promptly strangled to death by the revengeful puppet of his own creation. But it is impossible to do justice to all these stories separately, and it remains only to single out one typical example in which perhaps he reached the very pinnacle of his strange fantastic genius, the death of Halpin Fraser. The theme of the story is this, 
it is sufficiently horrible to be confronted with a disembodied spirit, but there is one degree of horror beyond this, namely, to have to face the reanimated body of someone long dead from whom the soul has departed. Because, so Mr. Beers tells us, with the departure of the soul, all natural affection, all kindliness has departed also, leaving only the base instincts of brutality and revenge. Now in the case of Halpin Fraser, it happens that the body which he is fated to encounter under these hideously unnatural conditions is that of his own mother, and in a setting as curiously and poetically unreal as any part of Kubla Khan, he is forced to realize that his mother, whom he had in life worshipped as she worshipped him, is now, in spite of her undiminished beauty, a foul and bestial thing intent only upon taking his life. In all imaginative literature, it would be difficult to find a parallel for this story in sheer, unadulterated hideousness. Mr. Ambrose Bierce, as a storyteller, can never achieve a wide popularity, at least among the Anglo-Saxon race. His writings have too much the flavor of the hospital and the morgue. There is a stale odor of moldy cerements about them. But to the connoisseur of what is rare, unique, and very perfect in any branch of fiction, he must appeal strongly as one entitled to hearty recognition as an enduring figure in American letters. No matter how strongly he may offend individual convictions and prejudices with the flippant irreverence of his satiric writings, it is easy to forgive him all this and much more besides for the sake of any single one of a score or more of his best stories. End of chapter 14 End of Some American Storytellers by Frederick Tabor Cooper Recorded by Céline Major.